Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Assemblywoman Carlton. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblywoman Dickman. Here. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblyman Flores. Present. Assemblyman Frierson. Assemblywoman Hardy. Here. Assemblywoman Kazama. Assemblywoman Martinez. Present. Assemblywoman Marzola. Here. Assemblyman O'Neill. Assemblywoman Tolls. Here. Chair Hadegi. Here. Madam Secretary, please note that Assemblymember Kasama and Speaker Frierson are absent excused. Welcome everyone to the committee and welcome to the audience tuning in over the internet. Before we start, I'd like to make some housekeeping announcements. Please remember all exhibits, testimony, written testimony and amendments must be submitted by noon on the business day prior to the committee meeting. Persons wishing to provide testimony or attend the meeting virtually must pre-register online at the legislature's website. The public is strongly encouraged to submit written testimony in advance of the meeting meeting by emailing the Assembly Commerce and Labor Committee at asmcl at asm.state.nv.us. Members, please remember to keep your camera on at all times. This will help us ensure that we have a quorum unless you are stepping away for non-committee related business. Members and presenters, please remember to be muted at all times unless you are going to speak and unmute your, then unmute yourself and promptly mute yourself right after. Thank you, everyone, and we can begin with our agenda items. I do want to let those know who are watching over the internet or logged in or have phoned in to participate that I will be taking the agenda items out of order. This is the order we will be proceeding with today. We will start with Assembly Bill 180, followed with Assembly Bill 222, and we will end with Assembly Bill 124. That being said, we can move on to our next agenda item, which is bill hearings. I will open the bill hearing on Assembly Bill 190, which provides certain employees with the right to use sick leave to assist certain family members with medical needs. I believe we have Assembly Member Bilbray Axelrod here to present the bill. Welcome, Ms. Bilbray Axelrod. And when you're ready, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Hadegi. You confused me there for a second. I went running out because you said 180. Oh. So, <laughs> I just went running out to my attache to make sure I was in the right place. So I apologize for that. I apologize too. Okay. So just give me one second to pull my presentation up and I will get going. Thank you. And happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. And while you do that, I do want to just make a quick uh, mention to the committee and we have three bills that we're hearing today, and it's my intention to break them up and give equal time to every bill. So we, if we could shoot for a 45-minute hearing, including um, testimony um, for each bill. Thank you. We do have two members absent excuse, and we will lose two members at 4 p.m. to another committee. Okay, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Howdicke and members of the committee. For the record, I am Shannon Bilbray Axrod, representing Assembly District 34 in Clark County. Thank you for your time today and the consideration of Assembly Bill 190, which would require private employers that provide employees with sick leave to allow employees to use such leave to help an immediate family member with certain medical needs. Assembly 190 would allow persons who need to take time off to care for their loved ones to use sick leave they've already accumulated. Use of sick leave for this purpose would be to assist an immediate family member who has an illness, injury, medical appointment, or other authorized medical need. The same conditions that would apply to the employee when taking such leave that would also apply to family sick leave cases. The measure 
authorizes the employer to limit the amount of sick leave that may be utilized for this purpose and the amount that is equal or not, but not less than 50% of the sick leave accrued during a six month period. Immediate family members include a child, spouse, domestic partner, sibling, parent, mother-in-law, father-in-law, grandchild, grandparent, step-parent, and foster child of an employee. To ensure employee awareness, the AB 190 requires that the labor commissioner prepare and post a bulletin that explains the provisions of the program. The bulletin must be posted online and in the workplace of, of every employer and provide employees with that, <laughs> that provides employees with sick leave. The measure requires the labor commissioner to enforce the program. Any person who violates provision of the program is guilty of a, a misdemeanor in the commission and may oppose an additional, additional monetary penalty, not more than $5,000 for each violation. A um, couple differences that I wanted to um, make. There was a bill last session uh, that was we worked on very hard, and I wanted to pe let people know that um, SB 319 from last session uh, to 2019 is a different that that bill only talked about um, companies that have 50 or more employees, and so this would cover uh, smaller um, smaller companies, and that's about 70 percent of companies out there right now. Um, and this would also not um, be collective bargaining wouldn't be affected by this bill. Um, Another confusion is FMLA. Um, FMLA was a, a bill that was passed through Congress, which is utilized for serious or long-term leave needs. For example, the birth of a newborn child or adoption or foster care or to care for an immediate family member with serious medical or health condition. AB 190 program helps caregivers with short-term health needs. For example, with COVID right now, if you have to take someone uh, in your family to the hospital um, or to uh, get get care from a doctor, to pr provide immediate family member with a brief illness and transfer that person, um, or even to rush a person to the hospital, and uh, that happens. FMLA provides eligibility um, for up to 12 weeks of unpaid job protection per, per year. AB 190 program would provide access to paid leave per the sick leave rules of the entity. So I want to say that again. This only applies if your company has a sick leave policy. Um, in the other bill that I referenced from the Senate that that um, deals with companies over 50, that is turned everything into PTO time, which you know, you can use for anything. If you want to take a mental health day, that's totally fine as well. So this is just specifically for companies that still are using the term sick leave. And, and it would apply to um, all companies that I just stated. Uh, why is this important? According to AARP, there are more than 350,000 unpaid caregivers in Nevada. And this is actually an old number. I, I happen to believe, especially in the last year, there are a lot more than that. One out of four workers who are age 25 or older provide unpaid caregiving. 60% of family caregivers are employed full or part-time, and seven out of 10 family caregivers report having to make work accommodations. These include late or leaving early, taking unpaid time off, reduced hours work, and or even quitting their job. So another important aspect of this measure is for our senior population. Once again, according to AARP and the National Conference of State Legislatures, there are 10,000 baby boomers that turn 65 each day, and each person has about a 70% chance of needing some type of long-term care service in the remaining years. So that means you're either a caregiver or you're going to be need the help of a caregiver. So I will remain for questions, but at this time, I'd like to invite Glenn Fuchs from AARP. He's a national senior legislative representative and also Barry Gold that I'm sure you all know very well, Nevada Dire uh, Director of Government Relations to further explain. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Glenn Fuchs um, and I'm a senior legislative representative with AARP's 
government affairs department in Washington, D.C. I focus on health and family caregiving issues. And thank you to Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod for inviting me to join you virtually to discuss AB 190. Um, bills like AB 190 are part of a larger trend of states recognizing this tremendous work of family caregivers and trying to better support them. Since 2014, over 500 family caregiver focused laws have been enacted in all 50 states. With respect to the type of bill that the committee is considering today, a dozen other states already have similar laws on the books. These bills often have strong bipartisan support, and I'm not aware of any indication that this has been too burdensome on businesses or any need for states to go back and adjust these laws on this basis. In addition, another 13 states that have state paid leave requirements allow that leave to be used for family caregiving purposes. Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod has asked that I go through the provisions of AB 190 and give a summary of the bill. Some of this um, Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod already just described, and I will point out where those sections are in the bill. Thankfully, AB 190 is pretty straightforward. Um, section one is the most complicated part. It has uh, seven parts. The first part requires that if a private employer provides employees with either paid or unpaid sick leave benefits, that the employees be allowed to use that sick leave to care for the illness or medical need of an immediate family member, in addition to the employee's own illness. <clears throat> this is not requiring employers to provide extra time or extra benefits. It is simply expanding the acceptable usage for sick leave benefits that already exist. An employee's use of sick time to assist a family member would be subject to the same conditions as when the employee takes sick time for their own illness, uh, meaning things like how notice is given, uh, whether a doctor's note is required, or uh, things like that. Part two allows an employer to limit the amount of an employee's sick leave that can be taken to assist a family member but provides that the employee should be allowed to use at least half of their yearly sick leave amount for family medical purposes. Part three requires the labor commissioner to prepare a bulletin about these requirements to be posted online and in a conspicuous spot in each workplace. My understanding is that this requirement is uh, comparable to, or maybe even exactly the same as requirements for posting information about other wage and hour laws in Nevada. Part four provides that employees will still have access to other benefits, rights, or remedies as may be provided by their employer or by law. So essentially, this bill is meant to be a floor and not a ceiling on employee sick leave rights. In specific, this part mentions that uh, this bill will not extend leave available under the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act. Um, how employers provide and treat FMLA is not touched by this bill. Part five provides an employer, uh, prohibits a, an employer from retaliating against an employee for using existing leave as allowed by this bill. Part six states that this bill does not apply to the extent that it is prohibited by federal law. So for example, Federal law exempts certain railway employees from certain state employment laws. So those employees would fall under the prohibition here. Um, similar language was included in uh, the Illinois and New Mexico bills that have passed in recent years. Part seven defines the immediate family member uh, for whom employee sick leave may be taken, uh, namely a child, foster child, spouse, domestic partner, sibling, parent, mother-in-law, father-in-law, grandchild, grandparent, or step-parent of an employee, um, and more broadly, any person for whom the employee is a legal guardian. And then finally, sections two and three of the bill outline the enforcement mechanisms for this bill, including setting forth penalties for violation. And again, it's my understanding that these sections simply put this bill on equal footing as other wage and hour laws uh, in Nevada code um, when it comes to enforcement. Um, and with that, I will uh, turn it over to my colleague, Barry Gold, uh, the Associate State Director for Advocacy for AERP Nevada, um, who, will who will discuss what AB 190 would mean for working caregivers in the state. 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Glenn. Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Barry Gold. I am the Director of Government Relations for AARP Nevada. Let's talk about caregivers and who caregivers are and who they care for. A very famous person who has a National Caregiving Institute said there are four kinds of people in the world. Those who are caregivers, those who have been caregivers, those who will need a caregiver, or those who... Um, have been caregivers in the past. Caregiving defines humanity. It's who we are, it's what we do. We take care of each other and we provide more care than the medical system ever will do. So it's important to think about that. Now I'll tell you that um, AARP did a study and of course we do lots of studies and I don't know if you can see this right here, but this is part of a caregiving thing that's a caregiving research project that was 107 pages long. I'd be glad to send that to you, but you probably would rather have the nine page executive summary. So what it talked about in the executive summary said that currently we heard about how many were in Nevada. There's 53 million people across the country. Back in 2015, it was only 43 million. Caregiving is increasing and growing. Some people have asked and they said, well, you know, we don't need this bill because everybody's going to pay time off. So why do we need to do that? Well, that simply is not true. The caregiving report in 2020 stated that for the working caregivers that they talked to, these are the working caregivers, 58% of them worked for a business that had sick leave benefits. And that's increased from 52% in 2015. So not only is sick leave still very prevalent in the business world, it's actually increasing because people are seeing that it, there's a need for that. Um, we've heard that nationally, it's 61% of caregivers are still working. Max, what we do here in our state is 60%. Um, what the other thing the reports have always said is, what are these caregivers doing? Well, a lot of them are doing really complex medical tasks, but once we're reserved for licensed staff trained personnel that caregivers are now doing. And so it's important to think these people are juggling both their caregiving and their job. And I guess the easiest way why we need to have this bill is people should never have to choose between their job and their work and caring for their family members, because I think we all know where that would where that would happen. So some other facts that AAR ha ha talks about is older workers, especially older women who are most likely to have the elder care responsibilities. And the study showed that it's 61% of caregivers are female, 39% are male. So these older workers are, are an increasing portion of the workforce, these older women, because women now increase account for a more significant portion of family income. Um, their jobs and the stability are even more important before. They should not have to choose. And lost income and benefits on average for family caregivers over 50 due to providing unpaid caregiving and losing their jobs and salary can be over $300,000 over a caregiver's lifetime. Um, they shouldn't have to give up $300,000 because they have to take care of their family. AARP has found out that employers who offer family-friendly benefits and caregiver-friendly benefits are better able to stay in their jobs, earn a living, and provide for their own families. So I think it's important that we think about that. And we talked about people not being institutionalized. Um, if people can stay at home and get some care at home, even with some assistance from the state, you've heard me talk about the home and community-based services and how they're fiscally prudent besides the right thing to do. Those home and community-based waivers cost about $5,000 a person. Nursing homes are $80,000 or up a person. So it really is in everyone's best interest, not just because it's the right thing to do to let people live with independence and dignity, but it's fiscally prudent to do that. And often these family caregivers, if they're allowed to continue working and taking care of their loved one, we're able to prevent that institutionalization. So I just wanted to kind of mention that. And, you know, I'm always famous for my taglines at the end. And we used to, I used to always say that, um, you shouldn't worry about having to take your mom to the doctor because um, you shouldn't worry about losing your job because you have to take your mom to the doctor. But in the year of the pandemic, it's even more so. You shouldn't have to worry about losing your job because you have to take your mom to the doctor or your mom has COVID-19. So all this, all this bill really does is for people who already earn and already have sick leave benefits, it's just allow them that flexibility, that humane use of their sick leave, sick leave to take care of their family members. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gold. Um, Ms. Bilbray Axelrod, was that it for presenters? Okay, perfect. Yes, that is, thank you. Okay, members, do we have questions for assembly member Bilbray Axelrod or any of her co-presenters? 
Um, I am going to go to assembly member tolls first. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. And I do have a, a, a few questions, if I may, some clarifying questions. And I appreciate the presentation and um, and also um, anticipating some of the questions and working those into that presentation. So I just want to make sure that I heard um, those clearly, because I, I, I think you did a, um, a good job, but I just want to uh, clarify a couple of things, if I may. And I do remember this discussion last session, um, especially because at that time I was caregiving for my uh, father-in-law who lived just down the street. And um, and so I really did um, appreciate you bringing this forward. Um, so in section one, um, we know that it's except as otherwise provided. It's only if an employer provides this paid or unpaid um, sick leave. And so it's it's it only applies to those who have this. It's not um, mandating an expansion or mandating that they do. But um, how does this impact the paid time off um, for 50 and above? Does this just not apply at all to those employers who have 50 employees and above. It's only for employers who have 50 and under, 49 and under, and who offer sick leave. Is that correct? Thank you for the question. So not really, and this is the reason why. That last bill in the last session changed the policy for 50 and above to PTO, which means you can take it off for any reason. So this would, so in one ways, in one way, this kind of keeps the pot under 50 because all the other companies that were over 50 have already moved to PTO and they won't have a term sick leave in their definition. So kind of de facto, it's only under 50, but that's just because of the bill, the bill in last session. Assembly member Bill Bray Axelrod, would you identify yourself when yeah, answering and this? Shannon thing? Bill Bray Axelrod for the record. Sorry about that. Okay. So... So I understand that paid time off for 50 and over is flexible. Um, under 50, it's for sick leave, and this sick leave can be utilized for these purposes. Um, and so the, the next question to clarify is that you stated that this doesn't apply to collective bargaining um, agreements, I believe, and I didn't see that in the language are we anticipating an amendment to explicitly say that this does not apply to collective bargaining agreements, or did I miss it somewhere in this original text? Uh, this issue's come up in the past. If you might remember, this is the third time this bill has been seen, um, and we always just put it on the record, and that seems to be um, enough for most folks, but if you need us to spell that out, we could do that. But as I said, in both testimonies last time, we just usually just get that on the record. And uh, Assembly Member Tolls, that's something I know our legal isn't present with us today, but maybe we could we'll ask him if, if it needs to be included in writing um, or if it's something, if it's implied in the language too. Unfortunately, he's um, he's not with us today, but that I think that would have been a great question to direct, we can direct his way. Wonderful, thank you, Chair. And, um, and I'll follow up with the sponsor. I, I, I do think that it might provide comfort to have that in, in writing and I, I appreciate the willing just to have that um, uh, considered. Thank you. Okay, and next we will go to Assembly Member Considine. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Assemblywoman Bill Braid Axelrod, for bringing this um, bill forward. I don't really have a question. I just kind of have a quick statement. Um, as someone who was juggling law school and a full-time job when my mother was um, diagnosed with cancer um, and having to to, to take out a few hours to take her to chemo or to take her to her doctor's appointment and the stress of balancing the need to pay your bills, the need to be there for your family, um, and also the need to be honest and straightforward with your employer so that you don't lose your job about, you know, why I need to take a couple of hours or this, you know, this morning off instead of taking that whole day because you have to balance how much you're going to get paid that day. Um, I truly appreciate this bill um, and the humanity of this bill. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Assemblywoman um, Bill Bray Axrod, for the record, that's exactly the purpose of this bill. Um, people don't like to have to, you know, call up their employer and <coughs> fake cough, you know, so when they're really just taking their mom for chemotherapy. So thank you for, for that comment. And, and it is it is the humane thing to do. Members, any other questions? 
Okay, uh, thank you for your presentation, Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. We can now move into the- I think that, um, Assemblywoman Hardy had her hand up. I'm sorry, Chair. Oh, no, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, thank you, Assemblywoman Hardy. Oh, I, I missed your message. I apologize. Please. Okay, okay thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I too just wanted to clarify something um, I think one of the other presenters said. So um, we established that it's only if an employer already has a sick leave policy. And then I think they said um, they have to go by whatever that policy is if they have a doctor's note or, or something like that. Um, is there anything additionally like an employer would have to do like in their record keeping, you know, to make sure that they're in compliance, that, you know, they granted it, they allowed it, or, or if they denied it, why? Um, any, anything like that additional? I'll, uh, Assemblywoman Chairman Bill Brayox, but I'll turn that over to Mr. Fuchs for that, just because we have, uh, this bill has been done in several other states. Um, and so he can speak to that at, on how that was handled. Sure, um, Glenn Fuchs for the record. Um, Madam Chair, to you and through you in response to uh, Assemblywoman Hardy's question. Um, so there is not anything extra that employers would need to do. Um, if in fact an employer wants to limit the sick time uh, to 50%, the, the sick time that can be used for family members to 50%, then they would need to keep that record internally. But that would simply be for their own internal uh, purposes. The law doesn't actually require that. They can let employees use all of their uh, available sick time to care for a family member. So again, it would it, nothing in the law requires additional record keeping on that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna do one last sweep. Members, any questions? Okay, Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I missed part of the presentation, so I apologize. They were playing with the computer so you could see me, unfortunately. Sort of dovetailing on um, Assemblywoman Hardy's question, would a employer, if they ask for doctor's leave for their employee to take sick leave, they'd be asking for doctor's information is there any HIPAA or any privacy violation problems we've got there asking about a, I guess you would say a third party patient that's not an employee of information to approve that sick leave or time off? Something on um, Bill Briax, Rod, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm gonna once again give it to Mr. Fuchs. Sure, uh, Glenn Fuchs for the record. Um, Madam Chair, to you and through you in response to uh, Assemblyman O'Neill's uh, question. Um, Nothing in HIPAA would prevent the family member for whom a sick day is taken from allowing a doctor's note or whatever is required to be provided to the employer to verify the employee's time off. Um, yes, it would be an extra step uh, if the employer requires that, um, but the, the employer does not have to require that. Um, but if they do, the employees will need to understand that that's the kind of documentation that's required. And in fact, this is already how it works when an employee takes long-term leave under federal FMLA. Um, they have, they, as I understand it, the employee has to uh, take an FMLA, um, uh, submit a medical certification uh, to the employer that includes both um, health information for the for the family member. Um, as part of that process, the ill family member authorizes their health provider to release that necessary information. Um, so the process would be similar here. Um, and given that we're talking about family members helping each other out, um, it's hard to imagine that it's going to come up very often that the ill family member isn't willing to release some minor necessary information. Um, and even if that were the case, uh, employers could always adjust their policies to account for that. Thank you, I appreciate that, Mr. Fuchs. Thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me the time. Thank you for your question, Mr. O'Neill. and. Okay, I'm doing one last check uh, for questions. It doesn't look like we have any other for, um, further questions. So now we, oh, we do. And I apologize, Assembly Member Dickman. And Mr. Fuchs, um, please, and presenters, please feel free to go directly to the members. By fault, Madam Chair, I'm so sorry. I was trying to get you through chat. 
<laughs> I forgot. I just, I guess I just have a quick question about the penalties. They seem to be somewhat steep. And on the, it, under the fiscal note, it says effect on lo local government increases or newly provides uh, for term of imprisonment. So I'm just wondering um, how onerous are the record keeping requirements in light of those rather large penalties? Mr. Fuchs, would you like to take that or Mr. Gold? Sure, uh, uh, Glenn Fuchs for the record. Um, this bill would go under chapter 608, which contain many of Nevada's wage and hour laws. Um, the penalty provisions would simply put this bill on the same footing as far as enforcement goes um, with the rest of those wage and hour laws. It would be treated the same. Um, in fact, I, I believe it would be out of the ordinary to add a requirement to Chapter 608 here and have it not be subject to the same level of enforcement, um, you know, by the district attorney or the, the labor commissioner or as would be appropriate um, in this situation. So um, we know employers are already uh, uh, keeping good track of, of hours and leave. And um, again, if they if they um, have the extra limitation of of only allowing 50% of the hours, then that would be one more step um, that the employer would have to take. Um, but again, it wouldn't be any more onerous or the penalties any more uh, strict than the current other similar laws. Well, thank you so much for that explanation. And as a small employer, um, I just wondered, you know, sometimes we don't have the software and things where it's just easy to keep track of our payrolls, but appreciate understanding what, what the reason is for that. Thank you. Mad Madam Chair, if I may. Mr. Gold, please. Um, yeah, for the record, Barry Gold, um, Director of Government Relations for AARP. If you look at the, the last section three, it talks about this is um, a misdemeanor. And the last thing it says, the labor commissioner may impose against a person an administrative penalty. So I think it says may impose. And I think that's important language to look at because I really don't think when these kind of things happen right now, that they're really giving those penalties to people left and right for doing something, um, especially if something was newer for the first time. So I think it's important that the language is just permissive and it uses may and it doesn't say shall. And the last thing, of course, that I have to say is on behalf of the 345,000 AARP members across the state, we appreciate you hearing the bill. Thank you so much. And thank you, Chair. Thank you. And members, I apologize if I moved quickly and missed your questions while you were trying to get through me, um, get to me through chat. Um, I'm going to do again one quick look, and I don't see any further questions. So now I will move us into the part of the hearing where we will hear testimony in support of Assembly Bill 190. Broadcasting, can we check the telephone lines to see if there's anyone wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 190? Yes, sure. To testify in support of AB 190, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you would like to testify in support of AB 190, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 700, Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. My name is Brian Wachter, B-R-Y-A-N-W-A-C-H-T-E-R. I serve as the Senior Vice President of the Retail Association of Nevada. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. We want to thank uh, the Assemblywoman for bringing forward AB 190. Uh, we believe the flexibility that this bill provides to employees, uh, for those who work in uh, businesses that have less than 50 employees or who do not um, prescribe to collective bargaining agreements, the flexibility that they need to be able to manage the care of those that they love um, and the ability for business owners um, and their employers to be able to meet that challenge uh, and be able to help them um, as they grow um, in their employment. So we support the bill and we urge its passage. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 601. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin.
Caller with the last three digits, 601. Yes. Um, good afternoon, um, committee and committee chair. My name is Barbara Paulson, B-A-R-B-A-R-A-P-A-U-L-S-E-N. And I'm speaking on behalf of Nevadans for the Common Good. Nevadans for the Common Good has consistently supported services that help people have home-based services, and in particular, we've uh, supported caregivers. Um, you've already heard a lot about the valuable service the caregivers provide and the contributions they make to their communities and to their families. And what I want to spend my time on is giving two brief stories about how um, this bill would plays out in real life. Uh, the first is my own personal story. In the 90s, uh, my parents moved to Southern Nevada to be close to me and my family because of my mother's cancer. They were relatively independent when they first arrived, but my mother's health quickly declined and my father was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. This began a cycle of changing needs. Um, although I was not their primary caregiver, I was the one that was coordinating their care, managing their medications, and taking them to medical appointments, as well as their emotional needs during this time. Also, at the same time, I was working full-time. I had two children in college and one in high school. So financially, this was not a time for me to cut back on my work hours. I'm eternally grateful to my employer, who gave me the flexibility that I needed to assist my parents and continue working. Just knowing that I had that flexibility was a stress reducer and enabled me to focus on my work when I was there. Another member of NCG on Violence for the Common Good told me her story, and I think she has submitted written testimony on this. She was in a situation somewhat different from mine. Her husband was ill, and she had to take him to a very important appointment that was 100 miles away from where they lived. And so she asked to use um, sick leave in order to do this. Her employer said she could not use sick leave for this because she herself was not sick. And in addition to that, she would have to pay for a substitute employee for the day that she would be gone from work. Um, the financial cost as well as the emotional uh, part of this was very upsetting. So you can see I benefited greatly from this. Another person um, did not benefit because their employer didn't provide this. Caregivers who are employed need this flexibility to use their existing sick time to provide care. The flexibility reduces stress and financial insecurity for the caregiver and helps prevent premature institutionalization of their loved one at a higher cost to the family and the state. Nevada and so the Common Good stands in strong support of AB 190. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller, please. If you recently joined the call, if you recently joined the call and would like to testify in support of AB 190, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 675, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. You can press star six, caller 675 to unmute. Hello? You are unmuted. Yes, you are unmuted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name for the record is Gilbert Yannick. I'm a... Um, 20-year volunteer for AARP uh, tax aid here in Nevada. And um, over the last 20-plus years, I see what most of our senior citizens live on. Uh, a lot of them are living w with, you know, some of their children, uh, and I know how difficult it is for some of the children to take care of the parents. Uh, I haven't had that problem yet. My parents are no longer with us, 
but uh, my children are, are, are here, and they need help. So the question of, of somebody taking time off to, to take their uh, a sick relative to the doctor is extremely essential. I mean, you have no choice. Uh, and I understand it from the part of a business owner as I was uh, an owner of a large aerospace company, and I had 550 employees. And with that number, you know that at least somebody every day or every other day is going to be out, and the majority of the reasons were to take somebody to a doctor, to an appointment, to the dentist. and. And I think this bill is extremely essential and important that the employers be able to exercise and, and work with this bill so that the, their employees can do the right thing for their family and, and be content. I mean, when they see the benefit that they're getting and the fact that their employer is providing them this time to take off to attend to the family responsibilities they have, they're a much happier employee, and I sure hope all the representatives support this bill and vote in favor. Thank you for the time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 837. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Hello, this is Kent Irvin, K-E-N-T-E-R-V-I-N, for the Nevada Faculty Alliance. This bill does not affect our faculty members and staff because we already have policies at NC that cover these situations, but many of our students are balancing school, work, and family responsibilities, and they need all the flexibility that this kind of bill uh, will give them uh, to just uh, deal with all those issues at once. So we support AB 190, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 237, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, committee. Um, my name is Marlene Lockhart, L-O-C-K-A-R-D, representing the retired uh, public employees of Nevada. We support AB 190 and our over 8,000 members have been caregivers themselves and through sickness and um, other uh, maladies that have involved their grandchildren, children, et cetera, and now in the later part of their lives, they, their children and grandchildren are caregivers for them. And so we think this is a very important um, piece of legislation to ensure that a benefit that's already been accrued to an employee be used in this manner. Thank you for your consideration. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Lockhart, for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller, please. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Perfect, thank you so much. We will now move into testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 190. Broadcasting, can you please check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in opposition? To testify in opposition of AB 190, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you, broadcasting. Um, next, we will move into neutral. Can we please check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in the neutral position? Yes, Chair, to testify in neutral on AB 190, 
please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of one, two, four, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Paul Moratkin, M-O-R-A-D-K-H-A-N with the Vegas Chamber. The Chamber is in neutral on the bill as introduced. We do not have an issue with expansion of sick leave definition as many of our members have been transitioned to the paid time off provisions because the greater flexibility offers employees and with adoption of Senate Bill 312 during the 2019 legislative session. I did want to take a moment and mention that many of our members, both small and large, that could have been providing greater flexibility and time and support to their employees and their families during the pandemic. Thank you, uh, Chair, for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Moratkin, for your testimony. Broadcast, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 584. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Richards, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-R-I-C-H-A-R-D-S. I serve as the attorney for the rights of older persons and persons with a disability as appointed by the governor. Um, my position is housed within the Aging and Disability Services Division. I just want to highlight for this committee some salient facts from the 2021 Elders Count. The Elders Count provides authoritative data on Nevada's older adults and is the product of a collaborative effort between the Center for Healthy Aging, the Office of Statewide Initiatives at the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine, Aging and Disability Services Division, and the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Data Analytics. Um, Nevada continues to see higher growth rates of older adults as compared to the rest of the nation. Additionally, in Southern Nevada, the rates of individuals who are limited English speaking proficiency is double the national rate. So these individuals will have a greater challenge in accessing information and services to meet their needs, allowing family members to attend appointments with their loved ones will be important uh, given our population here in light of that statistic. Additionally, we're seeing an uptick in multi-generational housing, which is much broader than just the spouse, child, um, parent, especially in Southern Nevada. That is much higher than the national trend. And finally, Social Security benefits are the primary source of income for many older adults, which means that many must stay in the labor force as they age. And so while they're acting as caregivers, it's important to be aware that many must still work and need the additional wages to supplement their benefits. I hope the committee will consider the 2021 elders account data in light of AB90, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'm broadcasting, next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 717, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Connie McMullen, C-O-N-N-I-E, capital M-C, capital M-U-L-L-E-N. Uh, I'd like to apologize. I missed the uh, in favor. I stand in favor representing the Washoe County Senior Coalition and uh, as publisher of Senior Spectrum newspaper in Northern Nevada. We are in favor of Assembly Bill 190. Thank you. Thank you. We will move your testimony into the support position. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of seven eight, excuse me, seven eight one. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and 
Members of the committee, Nick Vanderpool, N-I-C-K, V-A-N-D-E-R-P-O-E-L, with Capital Partners today representing the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce. Today, the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce is neutral on Assembly Bill 190 and reiterate what was outlined by my colleague, Mr. Merakin, with the Vegas Chamber, so won't repeat the comments. But as always, we want we appreciate working with Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod, as we did in 2019 on this topic. So thank you, Chair and committee members, and happy St. Patty's Day. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool, for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller. Chair, there are no more callers in neutral at this time. Thank you so much, Broadcasting. Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod, would you like to give any uh, closing remarks? Thank, thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Howdy for hearing this bill. Uh, I know you guys have a, a heavy schedule behind me, but I just wanna say just the fact that we had no opposition it just shows how much work has been done on this bill in the last three sessions. And here's to hoping third time's the charm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Assemblywoman. I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 190. Next item on our agenda is the hearing on Assembly Bill 222. I will open the hearing on Assembly Bill 222, and I believe we have Assemblywoman Torres here to present it. Assembly Bill 222 revises provisions governing employment practices. Assemblywoman Torres, um, when you're ready, please proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, Chair Haurigi and committee members. I am Assemblywoman Selena Torres representing Assembly District 3. And today I'm here to present AB 222, which revises provisions governing employment practices. Before I begin, I'd like to provide a brief roadmap of today's presentation. I will pro first, I will provide the committee with some background information and talk about the problem that this bill resolves. Second, I will go through the sections of the bill. And lastly, I'll invite Attorney James Kemp to make some additional remarks regarding this legislation. So first I'll begin with some background information about this legislation. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, workers have reached out to express their concerns for safety. This concern has not been limited to the stories highlighted in the news and social media. Many hardworking Nevadans have reached out to express their fears of reaching out to their employer and safety concerns um, because they were so scared of retaliation in the workplace. COVID-19 has exacerbated this issue as essential workers continued to go to work during the height of the pandemic, and in many instances felt unsafe and feared retaliation for speaking about the unsafe conditions in their workplace. Nevada workers deserve to feel safe and should feel comfortable talking to their employers about unsafe conditions without fear of retribution. Before I dive into the sections in this legislation, I think it's important to understand how this policy expands employee protections. Currently, if an employee feels unsafe at work and reports this to an external authority, like OSHA, a regulatory body, or the Labor Commission, they're guaranteed whistleblower protection. However, this protection is not guaranteed to employees who report this conduct to a supervisor or other appropriate authority within an organization. Nevada must encourage employees that find their working conditions unsafe to report these conditions to their employers and talk about these unsafe conditions so that these employers can quickly address this issue. This is beneficial for employees and employers. It encourages employees to talk to employers about unsafe conditions This and empowers the employer to have conversations with their team about safety and deal with the issues in-house instead of through the regulatory bodies. It prevents accidents since employees feel confident talking to their employers about unsafe working environments. And lastly, when an employee knows that they can come to their employer about an issue, it creates a better work environment and it improves the employee-employer relationship. I will next go through the sections of the bill. Um, you'll note that I did submit an amendment to this, leg to, to this piece of legislation and it has been emailed to the committee members, the committee manager, um, and I did deliver a paper version to the uh, committee members as well. Section one of this legislation. Section one codifies whistleblower protections for employees that report conduct that the employee reasonably and in good faith suspects may be unsafe. For example, if an employee does not have the proper equipment to safely perform their job duties, they'll be able to comfortably report their issue to their employer without that fear of retaliation. Later on this afternoon, I believe Abraham Camejo, owner and president of safety consultant for Camejo Safety, 
will be speaking in support of this legislation. Prior to this hearing, he expressed the positive impact that this will have on employees that he works with on a day-to-day -day basis. He described the stories of construction workers and landscapers that weep in his office because they know that their working conditions are unsafe and they fear retaliation if they speak up to their employer. This section of legislation will empower employees to speak with their employer regarding these unsafe working conditions. Section two of this legislation makes conforming changes to the statute. Section three of this legislation, if the employee makes a prima facie showing for retaliation, then the burden of proof shifts to the employer to demonstrate that the employee engaged in conduct that constituted gross misconduct. Additionally, section three defines gross misconduct. I want to clarify what that looks like and how it impacts employees. Essentially, if and only if the employee can demonstrate that they meet the criterion that establishes retaliation in section one, then the burden of proof is on the employer to demonstrate that the employee engaged in gross misconduct. Lastly, section four of this legislation. Um, presently, we have a work share agreement that exists between the Nevada Equal Rights Commission, which is NERC, and the United States e um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC. The present agreement allows for the filing of a charge of discrimination, harassment, or retaliation with one agency to simultaneously file with the other. This process is known as dual filing. The agency that receives the charge is generally the agency that processes and investigates it. Thus, the right to sue may come from EEOC or NERC when the case is filed in district or federal court. Due to the present ambiguity of the state statute, it has caused some issues for complaints in court. This section eliminates ambiguity of that section uh, and to the extent it, consistent with federal law, permits the dual filing of complaints. At this time, I will now pass it to Attorney James Kemp, who will make some additional remarks. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. I'm J.P. Kemp. I, I'm here on behalf of the Nevada Justice Association, and I want to thank Assemblywoman Torres for bringing this bill forward and for inviting me here to speak about it today. Um, it, it's important to have whistleblower protections and this bill is aimed at and protecting employees who act uh, in good faith and do the right thing and come forward with um, issues to their employer uh, about things that are in the workplace that might be illegal or might be unsafe. Um, as Assemblywoman Torres says, we've uh, proposed some uh, amendments to the original bill, and I'm going to talk about those uh, just a little bit and, and address the real problem, which is internal versus external whistleblowing. The Supreme Court of Nevada has recognized protection for whistleblowers, uh, those who uh, refuse to do unsafe or illegal things in their work, and also for uh, the whistleblowers who bring uh, those matters to uh, the attention of law enforcement, essentially. In other words, in, to have protection, you have to be an external whistleblower and, and report this uh, illegal or unsafe uh, conduct to uh, a regulatory agency that has uh, authority over the industry that the employer is in, um, or uh, other law enforcement uh, agencies, even the police, uh, you might have to go to uh, to turn your employer in to officials in order to have any protection. Uh, the Supreme Court is basically saying, well, we want this to not be just uh, personal uh, and petty things between the employer and the employee, but things that are actually of public interest. And, and that's well and good, but there are things that are of public interest that would probably be better off resolved in the first instance with the employer internally. And so that's what AB 222 um, is all about. Uh, it's about expanding Whistleblowing, whistleblower protection to not just the external, but also the internal whistleblowers uh, to have them have protection uh, here as well. So that um, an employer, employee that goes to the employer um, uh, can uh, feel safe in the knowledge that they're, they're entitled to be there to tell the employer that things that, that are going on in the workplace are unsafe and illegal and uh, have protection of the law if uh, they do that. And if the employer were to uh, retaliate against them. Some of the earliest cases in this area um, uh, have said, you know, safety costs money. You know, safety can be expensive for an employer. And there are lots of um, uh, employers who are willing to cut corners and do things that are unsafe 
uh, and employees should be able to come to the employer and say, we can't do it this way. It's not safe. It's illegal. So um, as a solution, AB 222, um, as uh, Assemblywoman Torres said, will uh, codify the Supreme Court's decisions um, and make it a statutory rather than a common law um, uh, protection. Uh, and it will expand it to include the internal whistleblowers. And, and uh, uh, to that end, we have uh, Section 1 of AB 222, um, which adds a new uh, section to Chapter 613 of NRS, which is where most of the employee uh, protections are found. Um, these uh, changes that we're looking to incorporate by amendment into Section 1 uh, will clarify um, that uh, existing tort remedies that are currently available uh, in the drafting, it seems that they overlooked uh, a couple of important uh, remedies that are available, uh, one of which is uh, general compensatory damages, which is your emotional distress and uh, mental anguish and other ways in which employees can be personally harmed. Um, those remedies uh, we're looking to uh, include. Again, they already exist with, in terms of external whistleblowing. Um, and also uh, punitive damages uh, in appropriate cases. Not all cases are appropriate for it, but a lot of retaliation cases are. And so punitive damages under NRS 42.005 in appropriate cases, we're having uh, that, um, uh, we're, we're looking to amend that in um, and to accept out uh, NRS 42.007, which talks about employers not being responsible for punitive damages of um, the malicious acts of their employees. We don't think it, it's uh, appropriate in this case to exclude the employer because it's really the employer that is ultimately uh, retaliating against the employee uh, uh, in these cases. So those are uh, some additions to the remedies um, that uh, we're looking at in the amendment. Uh, section two is so something when Torres said, just making some conforming changes. Uh, section three, uh, is an important uh, clarification for both retaliation claims uh, for whistleblowers and for those that uh, resist uh, unlawful and unsafe uh, actions in the workplace, but also would apply um, for employees who are retaliated against by employers in violation of NRS 613.340, which is uh, part of the, the statutory protections for employees um, with re respect to discrimination on the basis of age, race, religion, national origin, gender, disability, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Uh, so uh, 613.340 is the retaliation section that uh, protects against retaliation for those who oppose that type of illegal discrimination in the workplace. Uh, so what Section 3 um, is going to do is going to... to uh, change something that's that's kind of troubling because you can have a situation where an employee is being retaliated against, but uh, employers you know, know they're not supposed to retaliate against somebody who is engaged in protected activity. Uh, and so they will um, sometimes cast about or even wait a short period of time until the employee um, messes up in, in a, a slight way. Maybe they show up uh, a couple of minutes late to work and the employer will latch onto that and use that as a pretextual reason for uh, terminating the employee's employment. Um, so, so Section 3 of AB 222 looks to um, correct that or make it so that um, um, the employer uh, has to show if if the employee is able to establish this prima facie case of retaliation, let me explain what that is. Prima facie case uh, for retaliation is generally that the employee is engaged in protected activity, uh, that they have suffered an adverse employment action, and uh, there's a causal connection. In other words, the, the uh, protected activity has caused the, uh, protect the uh, termination, demotion, or other adverse employment action. So if a, uh, an employee is able to establish that, the prima facie the case and those elements, um, then the employer would still have a defense if they can show, and the burden, you know, burden of proof would shift to them to show that, hey, it's not, it's not the uh, whistleblowing or the opposition to disc uh, discrimination that's caused this. We have 
another reason. Uh, the employee has committed gross misconduct or uh, that get, basically no employer would continue to employ this person. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, we have uh, justification to terminate the employer employee's uh, employment. And we've identified some of the major uh, uh, types of gross misconduct. Um, there, there's some body of case law out there with respect to gross misconduct. Uh, one example is under COBRA. You know, everybody knows that uh, if you uh, get terminated or quit in your employment, you can pick up COBRA health insurance, uh, health insurance under, under COBRA. Well, there's a provision of COBRA that says you're not able to continue that insurance if you're fired for gross misconduct. And so the courts have, uh, that have looked at this have uh, found some pretty consistent categories, and they're what we list in the bill here. If, you're, uh, if you engage in, in theft or fighting or threats of workplace uh, violence, uh, if you're doing drugs, selling drugs, you know, you're intoxicated in the workplace, um, those are all examples of uh, things that have been held to be gross misconduct. And then we've also got in there and uh, some of the um, opposition we've heard actually as well, what does this uh, you know, other serious insubordination uh, mean? And, and that's intended to make this flexible so that an employer who does uh, have an employee that, uh, that engages in something egregious, but it's not within the categories that we've defined, could still argue that, look, this is serious insubordination. You know, that I was, the employer says, I was sitting in my office and this employee uh, came in and started hurling George Carlin's seven dirty words at me in an offensive manner, and that's the reason. And, and that type of uh, insubordination would also be uh, considered gross misconduct. Uh, I think most people would, would find that. So that's what it's designed. It, it, it is perhaps a little bit ambiguous and a little bit open to interpretation, uh, but a lot of things in the law do take um, uh, courts to... Uh, uh, analyze this and, and look at it on a case-by-case -case basis to determine uh, whether or not uh, an employer would be excused because they fired the employee for uh, gross misconduct. And, and I would like to point out this is also important because um, with whistleblowing and uh, the uh, retaliatory discharge for refusing to do something unsafe or illegal in the workplace, those common law retaliatory discharge claims, employee has to show in those cases that the um, protected activity was the sole cause. That is an extremely difficult um, uh, thing to show because employers, um, uh, you know, many courts have said, you know, employers uh, aren't dumb. They, they know that there are things that they're not supposed to do. And when they do those and they want to get away with it, they'll you know, cast about and find out, find that pretextual reason to um, say that, well, it wasn't, it wasn't just that. It was also the, the fact that the person um, you know, was, was late to work or, uh, you know, missed, uh, missed uh, this particular uh, nut or bolt on this widget that they were making. I mean, you know, something minor. So the idea is to have this be significant and not just minor uh, things that would uh, allow an employer to escape liability if they, uh, indeed, the employee had proven uh, that there was retaliation. Um, so, uh, I, I think that that covers, uh, section three and section four. I think, uh, Assemblywoman Torres has, uh, described that adequately. Uh, there are cases, I, I'm going to have a, a hearing in federal court on Friday on one of these, uh, matters where, uh, an employee, uh, went to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to file their charge. And under the work sharing agreement between the state and the federal agencies, uh, when you file with one agency, it's automatically filed with the other. And um, then the, usually it's the uh, agency with whom the, the charge was filed that goes ahead and processes that and investigates it. Uh, and so that's in the case I have on Friday, they went to EEOC, EEOC went through the process and issued, uh, at the end of it, issued a uh, notice of suit rights. And so when we filed the case under both state and federal law, uh, the uh, defendant uh, moved to dismiss the state claims because you never filed a charge with Nevada Equal Rights Commission. You only filed with the EEOC. Therefore, you haven't exhausted your administrative avenues under state law 
Um, so, so this is to make clear um, as part of that process that if you get a uh, notice of suit rights that's issued by either EEOC or Nevada Equal Rights Commission, that does give you the right to pursue your claims in court, and you can't be said it can't be said that you haven't exhausted your administrative avenues. And so that's uh, what's behind section number four of uh, AB 222. Um, it'll, it will you know, harmonize this uh, so that state law is uh, you know, given its proper uh, hearing, uh, even though the EEOC has, is the one that issued the uh, notice of suit rights. Um, so um, I, I think that that pretty much covers where we're going with uh, AB 222. And uh, it really is uh, uh, designed to protect employees uh, in the particular instance where um, they've tried to make things better. They've actually tried to pursue a course of action with their employer uh, that will make the workplace safer, uh, more honest, you know, and then follow the law. And when they get uh, retaliated against, there needs to be good and serious remedies for that employee. And that's what AB 222 is all about. And I um, ask for your support for that. Thank you. At this time, we are open to questions. And if there are specific questions that pertain to the work share agreement in Section 4 of the legislation between NERC and the EEOC, we do have um, Administrator Jen Cara Jenkins from NERC um, and the Chief Compliance Investigator, um, Ms. Vizcara, on the call as well um, that are more than happy to help answer some of those um, specific questions. Thank you. Thank you, Assembly Member Torres. Okay, committee members, I am gonna open it up to questions and I'm gonna start with Vice Chair Carlton. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. So I just wanna make sure that amongst the amendments that I have this correct, um, um, Ms. Torres. So section one of the bill will still codify the statute, the whistleblower protections that were established through the Nevada Supreme Court or is that section being removed? So it codify, um, as some of the for the record, um, thank you for the question by Chair Carlton. Um, so the that section of the legislation does codify that, but that it also clarifies um, the damages um, that could be, and the, comp the compensatory damages of the punitive damages that could be received from that. Okay, so I, I um... I guess I, I miss it. So I, I had thought that the language that was being proposed in section one in the amendment was replacing the other section one. So this is in addition to. Vice Chair Torres for the for the record. I'm sorry. By, thank you, Vice Chair Assembly Torres for the record. <laughs> um, and so the blue is what the blue on the amendment that you have received a copy of is what is currently um, in the piece of legislation that you have before you. And then the green is what would be added with this amendment. And perhaps I should have clarified that um, a little bit better on, on that. So I, I apologize for the misunderstanding. Um, anything in red is what's being stricken. Okay, uh, I have concerns about codifying a Supreme Court decision. Um, but we can discuss those uh, at another time or with uh, uh, the the other proponents. Um, I guess my second question would be, so currently the employee would file a complaint with one of the regulatory bodies, and then the regulatory body would step in and try to get the issue resolved. With this, with this current new structure, the employee could file a complaint directly with the employer um, and have have protections on that. But if it didn't get resolved, would the employee be able to take the employer to court? Would they have to go to the regulatory body next? What, what would be their steps as far as how to make this work through the process? Uh, for the record, uh, uh, J.P. Kemp and um, Vice Chair uh, Carlton, we, uh, you pretty much have it. The idea would be uh, that the employee would have the ability, that they could go straight to law enforcement. They could, they could still do that if they, if they wanted to, but this gives them the opportunity to go to the employer, 
And sometimes these things just come up kind of impromptu in, in meetings uh, with the supervisor, with management, and, and they could raise the issue there and they would have protection. Now, if the employer didn't correct things and they were still concerned about their safety, they could then go to um, a government agency safety or, um, you know, uh, public, uh, you know, the, the public's well-being in terms of if there's uh, consumer fraud going on or other issues. They could go to the regulatory agency after that and file a, a, a complaint if, if they felt like they should do that. But a lot of uh, a lot of these uh, issues, when it's brought to light, you know, hey, employer, you know, we really can't do this. This is not safe or it's not honest. We, we, we need to fix this. A lot of employers will recognize that and take steps to correct it. And, and this is an important um, step that the employees have protection because as it stands right now, under Wiltsey v. Baby Grand, uh, they have no protection at all. They have to go to the police or to the regulatory agency with law enforcement capability. They can't bring it up to their employer and expect to have any protection as a whistleblower. I hope I've answered your question. Um, Jen, yes, um, I believe there's other. There's. I'm, I'm still a bit confused about when when the employee will be able to hold the employer accountable. On this? Sure. sure. This is about whistleblower retaliation. So if uh, the employee is uh, terminated from their position or they're demoted or they're denied a promotion, they're disciplined in some way uh, in retaliation for their having uh, internally blown the whistle and brought to light things that the employer is doing that's you know, unsafe or illegal, um, it, it's when that adverse employment action is taken against them that they would have enforcement under uh, AB 222, that's when they would have the right to go to court. So if they get fired from their job because they uh, went to the employer and said, now what you're doing here is unsafe or illegal and you need to change it. And they say, oh, well, if you won't do this for, for us this way, then we'll find somebody who will, you're fired. And when, when it's that scenario, that's when um, they would have recourse uh, in a civil action against the employer for uh, whistleblower retaliation. And Madam Chair, if I could just ask one final question. Um, sometimes safety is in the eye of the beholder. Um, so how are we going to define safety in this? We've just been through a pandemic. Some people would see just asking people to go to work during a pandemic would be an unsafe atmosphere. At the very beginning of the pandemic, we didn't have masks. We didn't have face shields. We didn't have plexiglass. So I guess I really want to understand what the safety guidelines are because I can picture one employee seeing one thing as unsafe and another employee seeing something else as not safe and it's going to they'd be greatly divergent. So how do we define that? Is there an actual like is it with the within the OSHA standards? How what are we aiming at for safety? Uh, for the record, uh, J.P. Kemp and uh, Vice uh, Chair Carlton, um, a lot of these have to be uh, looked at on a case-by-case -case basis because every factual scenario is different. I mean, you mentioned the pandemic. I had several people uh, contact my office and speak with me about the fact that early on, especially when there was that shortage of uh, personal protective uh uh, equipment, the, the PPE, the, the masks in particular, how people were being asked to uh, reuse them, or I think there was one where they were being told, you know, I'll just turn it inside out and use it again. And uh, uh, they were very concerned about uh, uh, about their, their safety and very afraid to stand up to the employer on that issue and, and see, you know, can we find a different way or better way of doing this? And so that would be an example where somebody's safety was a concern in a pandemic where you don't, and you're working in healthcare and you don't have the proper uh, safety equipment. I, I think that that's um, one that's pretty obvious. And and you're right on, and so on some of these, you know, uh, it is going to be a case by case basis, but uh, I don't think it's usually terribly difficult to see when there is, you know, when the, uh, when the table saw doesn't have the proper guard on it or when, uh, um, you know, the uh, the tires on the delivery truck are bald and the brakes are going out. I mean, we, it's usually not 
that difficult of a question uh, to determine, I think, on a case-by-case -case basis. I hope I've answered your question. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll be happy to take the con the uh, other conversations on Section 1 with uh, Assemblywoman Torres offline on, on some of the issues uh, that I think we might want to discuss there. But thank you very much for putting some instances on the record so people have some perspective on what we're actually looking at. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you for your questions, Vice Chair Carlton. Next, I'm going to go to Assembly Member O'Neill. Thank you, Chair. You caught me by surprise. Um, Mr. Kim, this may be building a little bit on what Vice Chair Carlton had to say. Going to Section 3, can you tell me what other cases where the employee makes a prima facie case and it all ends up over onto the employer to prove that they're not guilty. The only one I can think of is really in sexual discrimination. Um, yeah, you know, it, to me, this seems rather ambiguous. Matter of fact, the whole part of three, you even admit it as ambiguous and that's good. Um, I haven't heard too many attorneys say that they like ambiguous statements. Uh Thank, thank you, um, uh, Assemblyman O'Neill. Uh, it's J.P. Kemp for the record. I um, well, the the part of it that there's you know some ambiguity and there there's some room for uh, interpretation is the part that says um, in the definition of what gross misconduct is that um, where there is any serious act of insubordination, and that would be uh, that would be an instance where. Uh, an employer may be able to show something other than the items that are listed, the, the uh, theft, you know, fighting, threats of workplace, uh, uh, violence, intoxication, selling drugs, doing drugs, doing some other, uh, you know, committing some other crime in the workplace or while on company time. Um, that, that, uh, that last one, any serious act of insubordination is designed to have flexibility so that an employer can come forward and say, well, I don't fit in those specific categories, but look what happened here. This is uh, uh, an act of insubordination that would amount to gross misconduct. So that's the uh, uh, the ambiguity uh, there. And uh, ambiguity is probably the wrong word. I think it's more flexible uh, in terms of what an employer you know, may be able to, um, to do. Um, with the rest of uh, that, so when there's a prima facie showing uh, usually, when, uh, a lot of the argument happens in uh, cases, and, and it's it would be not only in these whistleblower and uh, uh, common law retaliatory discharge claims that would be uh, codified in this statute, um, not only in those, but also in the uh, discrimination cases um, where there where the retaliation based on uh, the discrimination statutes. Uh, a lot of it does come down to um, the what they call temporal proximity. How soon in time did the adverse employment action happen in comparison with the uh, protected activity, right? So, and that's part of the prima facie case, right? The causal connection. So if you have somebody that complained to the employer about the, the brakes being out on the delivery vehicle four years ago, and now today they're getting fired uh, for, um, you know, something that, that wouldn't amount to gross misconduct. Um, they can't, they're not going to be able to make the prima facie case because they're not going to be able to establish that causal connection. They're not going to be able to show that the complaint four years ago caused the termination today, at least not without some other evidence. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes, uh, even though it's it's been a while, I mean, the, sometimes the employer or their, their managers say something. Uh, it's like, yeah, you remember when he did that a long time ago? Well, I think we've waited enough time now that we can go ahead and fire him for that. Let's say he was late to work, uh, you know, uh, last Tuesday. Um, if you had evidence like that, you'd still make the prima facie case. But in the absence of that, you know, where there's, there's long periods of time, you wouldn't be able to show the prima facie case. And so the burden shifting uh, with respect to a defense for uh, the gross misconduct would never arise under that circumstance because the employee would just, they, they would lose on a, on a motion for summary judgment because the judge would say, you can't prove your case. 
that, that you know what you did four years ago, you have nothing to show that that's what caused your termination today. But I hope I've answered your question, sir. Uh, Madam Chair, I just have one follow-up. Follow-up, Mr. Anil, go ahead. My sound sounds. I sound like I'm in an echo chamber on this side. Um, Mr. Kemp, I appreciate that. But let's go into four, section three, four C. Would it be better then in your statement of ambiguity to leave that could impair instead of striking could? So, oh, uh, so uh, Assemblyman uh, O'Neill, it's uh, JP Kemp for the record. Um, could impair, that is, um, so we run into a lot of issues there where um, um, let's let's take the thorniest of them all, uh, marijuana in Nevada now. If somebody's doing uh, marijuana in their off hours uh, and off of employer premises, uh, NRS 613.333, um, I argue would protect that. I don't think the courts have completely sorted that out yet, but there's an argument that that's, that that's protected. And so, uh, but what's not protected is if you are under the influence while you're working uh, or you're doing it on the premises of the employer during your working hours. Um, so that's that's not protected. And so uh, could impair is, is a little bit speculative. I mean, the, the idea that would be to show that there was some actual impairment. So. If somebody got in an accident and had a, a post injury or you know, post accident, post injury uh, drug test, and it turned out that they were intoxicated at the time, uh, then, uh, then they were impaired, not that they could have been impaired. Uh, because if somebody does marijuana while they're off on their vacation last week and then comes back to work this week, they probably aren't actually impaired if you took a blood test that probably wouldn't show the requisite amount of THC in their blood to establish intoxication or impairment. So um, that that's why um, that particular word was changed. Our, our, in, in our proposed amendment, obviously, um, you know, it's not set in stone, and we can we could certainly still talk about it. But we, I, I, I think we are the consensus that that's just a better way to do it, that somebody that actually is impaired and might, might and not just might. Thank you, Skip, I appreciate it. Thank you, Chair, for the time. You're welcome, Mr. O'Neill. Next, we are gonna to go to Assembly Member Marzola. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation, Assemblywoman Torres. Um, my question is, um, in your amendment, section one, subsection one A, where it states um, the employee can report to an appropriate authority, whether internal or external. Does that um, report have to be in writing or can it be verbal? And I guess it's twofold. And if it is verbal and you're reporting it internally, how can um, the employee have some protect themselves? Um, thank you. Uh Assemblyman Marzola, uh, J.P. Kemp, for the record. Um, yeah, 1A is actually, that's, that is um, original language. And um, maybe we didn't do the amendment quite right in terms of what color uh, was used for that. But um, so reports to an appropriate authority, whether internal or external to the employer, um, the internal, you know, the proper authority internally would be um, somebody that has the power to uh, to change the practice that's being complained about or the power to investigate and make recommendations about changing that uh, uh, that particular uh, uh, practice that, that the employee is complaining about. Uh, with respect to how reports are made, um, there, there have been, um, I, I, I could, I'd have to, to bring up a brief that was filed in a case called uh, uh, Riber versus uh, Reno Dodge. Um, a uh, a co-counsel of mine, I, I was involved in that case a little bit, um, co-counsel from Washington, D.C., uh, did an excellent ex explanation and cited to things where uh, limiting complaints to written complaints is 
problematic because, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of times these uh, complaints are made in, in the context of discussions that are had in meetings, and they come up sometimes in an impromptu matter, and there isn't really a, uh, a written record of it. And some employee, employers, frankly, I've seen employers uh, tell employees, don't send me emails on this, don't put it in writing, don't create a paper trail on this. So they're actually instructed not to do it. And so you would miss a lot of uh, the whistleblower retaliation if you were to require some particular form, whether that it be in writing uh, or that it be uh, that, it, that it, uh, there would be some sort of specific procedure. Uh, it's generally not considered flexible enough because the way that these things come up. And you know, you could say it in a meeting. Um, you know, hey, we're doing this, it's illegal, and we should not do this. And the employer could look over at you and say, you know, if you're not going to do it for us, you're fired, get out of here. And it can be that fast, and there's no opportunity. So if you put a requirement for writing or some uh, specific process of, uh, of complaint, uh, you, you end up uh, boxing out um, uh, some people. And yeah, then, but there is, and there is the proof problem, right? I mean, I mentioned the, the three elements of... Uh, of retaliation, protected activity, um, adverse employment action, and uh, 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 a causal connection between the two. Some courts have said, well, there's also uh, another element, and that's knowledge. And that's that the employer know that you've actually made the complaint. And so if you, if you are able to show all of those things, then you're going to make your case. And if you're not able to prove it, I mean, if you say, well, I told the employer this, and they say, well, no, you didn't. Well, that's why we have jury trials. That's you know why we have uh, dispute resolution processes, and it's going to be whoever can produce the the most cogent and and uh, compelling evidence of what took place. And sometimes there are witnesses that that saw it. Sometimes there aren't. Um, you know, cases uh, come in all in all uh, shapes and sizes. So uh, that that is. Um, yeah, that's just the nature of, of how, how these go. But uh, to require a writing or some specific process um, would have a lot of cases slipping through the cracks. I hope I've answered your question. You have. Uh, we will go. Uh, you're welcome, Assembly Member. We will go to Assembly Member Dickman next. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I, I have two questions, actually. One refers to to um, section one, this is the amendment, section one, um, sub three, where it says the court shall award reasonable costs. Why have you crossed out party and made the, changed the word to employee? If the uh, employer ends up prevailing, who makes them whole for the costs that they've had to incur to fight this action? Assembly member, uh, Dick, uh, thank you for bringing that up. I did uh, forget to mention that in my earlier discussion. Uh, it's J.P. Kemp for the record. Um, so in many cases um, where there are these uh, fee-shifting statutes, and that's what we call this, we call this a fee-shifting statute, where the, um, the cost of the attorney's fees for um, one of the parties is uh, shifted over to be borne by the other party, and in employment cases, most employment protection statutes have that, whether it be uh, overtime minimum wage under the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act or NRS 608, um, the Bad Equal Rights Commission, um, uh, the, the, the laws that the discrimination and retaliation laws that, uh, that it oversees have fee shifting provisions, uh, Title VII, the Civil Rights Act, a lot of the federal uh, uh, statutes also have these fee shifting uh, provisions. And generally speaking, they are held to be pretty much one-way streets unless um, it's, it's shown that the uh, employer, um, or rather the employee brought the case that was completely baseless and completely frivolous. And in that case, you have other statutes that would protect uh, an employer from, you know, these, these baseless and frivolous cases. Uh, in my experience, they're very rare. I don't have time in my practice to be pursuing cases that I don't think have good merit. Um, but if there, if, if there was such a case, then um, in Chapter uh, 18 of NRS, there are provisions for addressing that, for um, essentially assessing sanctions against uh, 
uh, a party and or their attorney for cases that are brought in a frivolous manner. The same thing with uh, uh, Rule 11 of the Nevada Rules of Civil Procedure. There are mechanisms for that. But in terms of having it in the statute that the prevailing employee would be entitled to those attorney's fees and costs, that's pretty consistent with the way that um, uh, fee-shifting statutes in employment cases are uh, done and, and changing it to prevailing employee rather than prevailing party makes clear that that's what's intended um, by this. So it's, it's, it seems, especially the case you're making right now, is that the case for the employee would be awfully good for most attorneys to take it. Um, that seems even more like the employer, if they were to prevail in a case like that, should have some recourse. But anyway, that's just... Uh, my other quick question was, this bill almost makes it sound like we have no... Uh, whistleblower protections in Nevada, but don't doesn't Nevada law already have some existing protections for whistleblowers? For example, could they go to OSHA? Lynn, sorry for the record. Um, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Dickman, and I think that, that, um, that that's exactly the point that we're trying to make with this legislation, is that we want to encourage employees to speak to their employers when they have these problems. Um, in, in the workplace, and we want to make sure that they feel comfortable um, and, and that they know that they won't be retaliated against. I mean, it, in many instances, I can say in my community, uh, workers have reached out to me because they 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 need to they would they want to go to their employer, especially when you're working in a small business. You want to go to your employer and talk, have that conversation. You're not trying to get them in trouble. You're trying to stay safe. Um, and so this legislation really encourages employees to have that conversation with their employer and gives them some level of protection because we do give that protection when they're speaking to when they're when they have that conversation with the regulatory agency. But we're not currently providing that that level of protection when they're having that conversation with their supervisor. Um, and, and quite honestly, I, I, I think that it's better for employer and employee relationships uh, when employees feel confident that they can have that conversation with their employer. Thank you. Yeah, I was on mute. Okay, we will go to Assembly Member Tolls next. Thank you so much, Chair, and um, thanks for the discussion. There's certainly a lot here and a lot of different um, ways to interpret this. And I guess maybe the best way for me to do it is to paint a little bit of a picture um, of of just where this might go and how this could potentially be applied. And um, can help correct my um, understanding if I'm incorrect. But I think my concern is, let's say I'm an employer and I, you know, for a number of reasons, am planning on letting somebody go and they're just not a good fit or there's been, you know, some issues um, or I, I need to, you know, have layoffs and what have you. Um, and then that employee, um, you know, reports to OSHA or, you know, CDC or some somewhere else that um, I, I'll, I'll steal Vice Chair um, Carlton's description that sometimes safety is an eye of beholder, but they they make a report. I'm already in the process of planning on letting them go. Now, as an employer, I may fear that this will end up leading to civil action, damages, lost wages, have it being forced to reinstate them in their position, keep them on board. Um, when I had other reasons why I wanted to let them go. Could you help walk me through that scenario? Because it seems to really shift that burden onto the the employer. Now, all of a sudden, just because there's a, a complaint out there that I have to prove my reason to let that employee go when we're in at-will state. Um, yes, uh, something we were told. It's uh, JP Kemp for the record. Um, with respect to the scenario that you've um, just laid out, uh, that really goes to the third element of the prima facie case for retaliation, and that's showing the causal connection. And if if you did have, have you know clearly existing before um, the whistleblowing took place, you had this this clear um, indication that you were going to be letting the person go. And I mean, yeah, it could, it could happen very suddenly. It could be, uh, yeah, you know, uh, Joe's been doing this, that, and the other thing, we're going to let Joe go on Monday. And on Friday, Joe goes and makes a complaint, and you hear that he's made this complaint, but you fire him anyway on Monday, and it's going to look like it's retaliation. But most employers do have 
um, pretty good records. You know, they they have uh, either systems of uh, progressive discipline or they, you know, they've had people on performance improvement plans or something. And if they can show that that causal link, that third element, that the causal link doesn't exist, then the prima facie case doesn't even get made. Again, the, the, the part about gross misconduct is talking about when somebody has completely proven that there was retaliation here, um, you know, the, if, if the ultimate thing that the person gets fired for was this gross misconduct, then they will still have a defense. And, and there are, in, in the federal uh, anti-discrimination cases, there are things where there's a, something called, um, there's a defense, I forget exactly what they call it, but essentially it, it's where the employer shows that they would have taken the same action even you know, even though there was this protected activity or or there was discrimination, they would have done it anyway, and that's really what this tries to address. Is it? It gives the employer that defense. If you can show that, hey, you know, we're not going to let anybody sit around here who's stealing from us. We're going to fire that person, and it doesn't matter if they blew the whistle on us or anything else. Um, it, it, so so it's it's at that stage. It's where you're showing we had a legitimate reason of, of gross misconduct with this person anyway and so we would have done this anyway and uh you know somebody that that looks at those uh that gross misconduct um says yeah i mean the employer has this independent independent uh reason for firing somebody that no employer would continue to uh employ the person under those circumstances so that's that's really what it's about so your scenario is really back at the prima facie stage where you're saying there's no causal connection here. We already Joe was on his way out the door on Monday, and he came in and did this. That there's no cause, no chain of causation here, and and a lot there there are you know, there are the reason we have court courtrooms and we have trials is because there are disputes over what the facts are, uh, and that that happens in every case is not crystal clear, uh, and that's just the, the way that the world you know works in in this arena. So, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you, Madam. Just a summary follow-up. Yes, and then uh, if any other questions that you think you can take offline, um, Assemblymember Tolder and anyone else, I would like to remind you guys we are 45 minutes out from 4 p.m. We lose two members to the afternoon committee, and we still have one more bill to hear. So go ahead, Ms. Member Tolles. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, so I'll, I'll then make this uh, even Quicker. Do you have examples of other states um, that have implemented this uh, type of language, and how did that interact with at-will um, status in those states? Um, uh, thank you, Assembly uh, Member Tolls, uh, JP Kemp, for the record. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, I don't uh, unfortunately have specific states, um, but what I can tell you is that. Um, there are some states that uh, utilize something called mixed motives, where the employer will still be liable even though they had mixed motives. So in the case where they have um, um, a retaliatory reason for terminating the employee's employment or taking the other adverse employment action, and they have something that's legitimate, you know, the person has been uh, late, you know, they've, they've accumulated 10 attendance points and, you know, we were going to, you know, let them go anyway. Um, there are there are certain systems where those mixed motives would still give you the cause of action because you still have that one illegal reason. And in some cases um, where there are mixed motives, um, the remedies can be slightly different. Um, uh, but usually you, you will still be able to establish liability on mixed motives. It's not that way in, in all jurisdictions and not that way in all states. And uh, for retaliation, the federal system is not that way. Um, but there are uh, a number of places, I, I'm sorry, I can't list them off the top of my head, but there are a number of places where those mixed motives are recognized as being actionable. Um, this is actually a little bit stronger than that, uh, just mixed motives, because if you, if you can show the... Uh, um, the, the compelling gross misconduct, uh, you, a, an employer would have a defense. So I hope I've answered your question. Thank you, Assembly Member Tolls, for your questions. Okay, members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we will move into the support 
portion of the bill hearing broadcasting, can we please check the telephone lines for those wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 222? Yes, Chair. To testify in support of Assembly Bill 222, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 741, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and we begin. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Kappa. That's P-A-U-L-C-A-T-H-A. -A -A, and I'm representing the Culinary Workers Union Local 226. The Culinary Union supports Assembly Bill 222 because it extends whistleblower protections to workers who make internal reports of illegal conduct or unsafe working conditions and strengthens protections against retaliation. The Culinary Union represents 60,000 workers, and we know that it can be frightening to speak up in a workplace. But when workers speak up about injustices in the workplace, it is in the best interests of themselves, their coworkers, and the public. Whistleblowers should not have to worry about retaliation. The lack of workplace whistleblower protections creates a chilling effect leading to employees not reporting illegal and unsafe conditions. Current Nevada law provides legal protection to external whistleblowers. It makes sense to do the same for those who make internal reports. In the midst of a global pandemic, it is more important than ever that workers not be forced to participate in unsafe activity. Nevada lawmakers must ensure workers have the protections they need to keep everyone safe. Workplace safety is public safety, and stronger protections help employees and customers. AB 222 is a common sense measure that standardizes Nevada's protections for whistleblowers and will lead to safer workplaces. As the largest organization of working families in Nevada, the Culinary Union supports this bill and encourages you to do so as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katha, for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller, please. If you recently joined the call and would like to testify in support of AB 222, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 352, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. You are unmuted. My name is Abraham. Hello, my name is Abraham uh, Camejo. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I do OSHA training for individuals here in Las Vegas. I am one of the trainers that um, works with employers and employees, making sure that they are compliant with these uh, safety protocols. One of the biggest things that I see that comes in here in my office is employees coming and complaining that they don't have the right to whistleblower, that they fear retaliation uh, from their employees due to superintendents, foremen, or managers that don't re record these complaints or don't communicate properly to their bosses or to the owners of the companies. At the same time, these workers have fears of being fired because of some for due to immigration status, uh, workers from landscaping to construction. They, there's so much fear in the, in the Hispanic community and in and, uh, supporting this bill for Assembly, Assembly Bill uh, 222 is, is a great thing moving forward um, where it would give more protections towards these hardworking Nevadans uh, that are working hard. And at the end of the day, they just want to be employed and have safety as their main priority in their work. We all have the right to a safe working environment as stated in the OSH Act of 1970. And being able to make a complaint and have OSHA and the other uh, administrations um, move forward with these and have it properly documented, it is a great resource and it's a great way to having Nevada becoming a safer 
uh, workplace for all Nevadans. And I, uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Camejo, for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 837. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and maybe. Hello, this is Kent Urban, K-E-N-T-E-R-V-I-N for the Nevada Faculty Alliance on behalf of our members. We support SB 222 because we believe the best place for positive resolution of workplace issues should be internal and along the supervisory chain, and that reporting without fear of retaliation should always be possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Irvin, for your testimony. Broadcasting, do we have any other callers on the line in support? Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. At this time, we can move into those and to opposition testimony. Can we check the line for those wishing to testify in opposition? Yes, Chair, to testify in opposition of AB 222, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. If you recently joined the call and would like to testify in opposition of AB 222, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 114, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and maybe in. Thank you and uh, greetings Chair Hadegi, members of the committee. My name is Amber Stidham, that's A-M-B-E-R, last name Stidham, S-T-I-D-H-A-M, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Henderson Chamber. We do have a number of concerns with this bill. Uh, we did provide a more detailed letter um, on public record if you are interested in reading it. Um, Right now, just uh, as it stands, we, we believe federal law already provides a lot of these protections against retaliatory employment practices aimed at whistleblowers uh, in public and private contexts. We also know that Nevada law also provides many of these protections. And even though I believe that this proposal is well-intentioned and certainly we don't support um, unlawful uh, employment practices, we also believe that this proposal may also expand protections to employees who only report alleged contact conducts uh, to their employer. A couple of other notes. Um, we do have some concerns about the initial burden on the discharge employee to show retaliation and the burden shifting mechanism, the burden of proof, uh, requiring employers to prove the absence of illegality, uh, especially based on some of the vague terms that a lot of the uh, committee members uh, discussed today. Uh, through the prima facie, just some of the general observations, just the, the metrics to which um, someone can fall, file a lawsuit against an employer is um, concerning to us. We'd like to see some additional levels of sort of evidence to illustrate that a, a, a legitimate incident had occurred. Um, also, this proposal would require employee, employers to prove that an employee engaged in gross misconduct to justify their, deter, their termination. I know this was also mentioned during the hearing. We do have a couple concerns here in that one, the definition of what really constitutes, quote, gross misconduct is um, really limiting and we believe would really um, impede the at-will nature of the employer-employee relationship in the state of Nevada for most of our businesses. And two, the vague language such as any serious act of insubordination, uh, which is listed within Section 3, we believe can be left largely open to interpretation. We're not certain of what would constitute a serious act of insubordination. And so for those reasons, we are strongly opposed to it. We are open to working together with the bill sponsor. I really appreciate today's discussion and that's um, all we have to share today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stidham, for your testimony. Broadcasting, can we go to the next caller, please? Caller with the last three digits of 124, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and we begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Paul Moratkin, M-O-R-A-D-K-H-A-N with the Vegas Chamber. 
I would like to thank the sponsor for meeting with the chamber regarding AB 222. In regards to the bill, the chamber does not have an issue with wanting to provide additional protections for the whistleblowers. In fact, Nevada has laws in place that does provide specific whistleblower protections in the NRS 618. However, we have concerns with several provisions of the bill and how it impacts the state's legal climate for employers. The broadness of the good faith standard in Section 1 is exceptionally brought in as a concern. The legal remedies are also another concern for our organization and also have extensive concerns relating to Sections 3 and 4 with a significant shift in burden and expansion of tort claims beyond current remedies. We also believe this bill will go beyond codifying what Nevada Supreme Court has ruled. In, t in times of economic recovery, the Chamber believes in enabling additional legal actions against employers will hurt the state's economy from our recovery from the pandem pandemic and hurt Nevada's families. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Maradkin, for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 139. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and we begin. Good afternoon, committee and Chair Haudegui. This is Misty Grimmer with the Ferraro Group representing the Nevada Resort Association. Um, much of our opposition to the bill has already been stated by other callers, so I won't go into a lot of detail. Um, but we are in opposition to the bill um, in several sections. We did have a meeting with Assemblywoman Torres and very much appreciate her being open to our our concerns and we look forward to, to working with her and Mr. Kemp and other interested parties in hoping that we can find some, a little bit more middle ground on this bill if possible. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Grimmer for your testimony. I'm broadcasting, next caller please. Caller with the last three digits of 781. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Nick Vanderpool, N-I-C-K-V-A-N-D-E-R-P-O-E-L with Capital Partners today representing the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce. Uh, today, the Reno Sparks Chamber of Com Commerce is opposed to Assembly Bill 222. I'll start with the business community in the last 12 months. Employers have gone above and beyond for employees for, who both were trying to survive, who were trying to survive during this pandemic while trying to find light at the end of the recovery tunnel. Here we are trying to apply another level layer above what federal law already outlines, which we believe puts in place and provides significant protections for employees. And as stated, Nevada already has a statute in place for whistleblowers. We'll continue to work with Assemblywoman Torres, but as AB 222 was presented, we simply must oppose this bill. Thank you, Chair and committee members. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool, for your testimony today. Um, broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 700. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and maybe begin. My name is Brian Wachter, B R Y A N W A C H T E R. I'm with the Retail Association of Nevada. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, first, I want to say we're proud of our hundreds of uh, thousands of employees over the last 13 months who have risen um, above and beyond in order to serve our communities and make sure they had life-saving medicines, food to survive. Uh, we have spent hundreds of millions of dollars, um, north actually of a billion dollars, on employee incentives, on increasing um, employee starting pay, as well as actually investing in making our facilities more safe for our employees and our customers. As the vice chair noted, safety is sometimes subjective. Um, the law currently requires employers to take safety precautions, and any violation of those safety precautions would fall under the current whistleblower standard. 
Furthermore, our understanding is that under the COVID example, that would also fall under our current statutes as NRF 414.070 gave full force and effect of every edict from the governor's office, including involving the safety requirements that our companies had to follow during the COVID situation. Um, we had to follow guidelines from the federal government, guidelines from the state government, and also guidelines from the local government. And it sometimes took weeks for us to be able to understand what was safe and what wasn't safe. Um, and under this bill, AB 222, that would have been very difficult and open to a lot of interpretation, and we feel would have made that uh, situation more difficult. Uh, we are also opposed to how broad the amendment further makes AB 222. We worry that by um, defining the reasons an employer can terminate an employee erodes decades of precedent set by this legislature, including the requirement that no other employer would hire that employee before you let them go. Um, we also strongly disagree with Mr. Kemp's characterization that business owners in general spend time and effort trying to circumvent employment law. Uh, we feel that those kinds of statements are a gross misrepresentation. Um, as the vast majority of business owners want to be do right by their employees and earn a living, as well as potentially see their co um, and they will potentially see their costs increase due to the bad actions of a very select few. Uh, we believe that the current law is sufficient, and we urge you to vote no on AB 222. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Wachter. Um, broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 496. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and we begin. Yes, you are unmuted. Caller with the last three digits of 496. Caller with the last three digits of 598. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and they begin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Nicole Rourke, N-I-C-O-L-E-R-O-U-R-K-E -E, with the City of Henderson. Uh, today I'm representing the Urban Consortium. We reached out today to Assemblywoman Torres and appreciate her willingness to work with us uh, after the hearing. We did uh, send a memo outlining uh, many of the concerns that you've already heard today from the business community. Um, but in addition to that, we're also, I have some concerns about the redundancy or duplication that may cause confusion with our collective bargaining agreements. And so uh, when we describe um, reasons for termination um, for insubordination, whether or not that standard uh, would meet the higher uh, standard uh, outlined in the bill for serious uh, insubordination under gross misconduct. Um, with that, we again like to thank the sponsor for um, wanting to work with us uh, after the hearing, and we look forward to uh, trying to come to some agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rock, for your testimony. Um, broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 570. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Leah Case, L-E-A-C-A-S-E. -E. Here today on behalf of the Associated General Contractors Nevada Chapter. Uh, I'll keep it short today, we just echo what our partners in the business community and the retail association have said this afternoon and look forward to working with the sponsors in our opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Case. We appreciate your brevity. Um, broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 496. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. I believe that's Ms. Daslick. Ms. Daslick, can you hear us? I have her signed in. Ms. Daslick, can you hear us? You are Ms. unmuted. Daslick, uh, uh, caller. Uh, 
Um, just for the record, that's Ms. Alexandra Daslik signed in in opposition with the Nevada Resort Association. Um, Ms. Daslik, if you are having trouble uh, un unmuting yourself or um, with audio, know that you can always send in a letter to our committee manager as well that she can share with the committee members and post for the record as well a letter. Ms. Daslik? Okay, call it. Broadcasting, um, we can go to the next caller. Will do. Um, caller with the last three digits of 109, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Justin Harrison, J-U-S-T-I-N-H-A-R-R-I-S-O-N, representing Clark County, uh, here today also in opposition. And I uh, won't take too much time, won't belabor the points that have already been made by those um, private and public sector entities that have already spoken, would just reiterate the points um, made by Ms. Rourke and the City Henderson, the Urban Consortium that uh, Clark County does have concerns about the bill and how this uh, may interplay with currently negotiated collective bargaining agreements that we have here at the county. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Okay, thank you. We can now move to support in the neutral position. Broadcasting, can we check the telephone line for those who are wishing to testify in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 222? Yes, Chair, to testify in neutral for AB 222, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for neutral at this time. Um, broadcasting, if we could just wait one second. I believe we just saw uh, Ms. Jenkins unmute herself to give testimony in neutral. Thank you, Chair Hagley. It's so good to see you. I hope you're having an amazing day. Um, I want to say a good afternoon. My name is Kara Jenkins. I think it said Sarah Jenkins, but I, I am Kara Jenkins. Last time I checked. <laughs> And I'm the administrator for the Nevada Equal Rights Commission. And I uh, just want to say that NERC is encouraged by this legislation, and we have no issues with the provision um, as it relates to statute of, I'm sorry, as it relates to uh, issuance of the right to sue. Um, it's correct, and I think it's clarifying. So uh, we're encouraged by it. And that's all I wanted to just say. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins, for your testimony. Um, and then broadcasting, if we could just check the telephone one more time for uh, those wishing to testify in a neutral position. I do see that I had one other person signed up to testify in neutral. Yes, sir. To testify in neutral for AB 222, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers in neutral at this time. Okay, thank you, Broadcasting, for checking for me. Miss um, Assemblymember Torres, would you like to give any closing remarks? Yes, thank you, Chair, um, and I'll keep it as brief as possible. Assemblywoman Selena Torres, for the record, um, and I really want to thank the uh, I want to thank all those that came in support um, opposition and neutral to testify on this legislation today. And I know that many advocates in the business community um, have reached out to me before this call, and I really do appreciate that. Um, and I look forward to continuing conversations um, on how we can pass policy that truly is uh, beneficial for both employees and employers. Um, and I, I just want to clarify a couple things for the record. You know, th this bill is not aimed at good employers. Um, it's designed to encourage employers to do the right thing and to hold those accountable when they're not doing the right thing. It's really aimed at targeting bad actors and fixes an unfair loophole in the Nevada state law. Uh, additionally, I want to clarify that the in order for the burden um, 
in order for them to meet the burden of proof, they still have to meet the, these other standards. So I think that they're, the, we can have a much larger conversation of what that prima facie showing uh, means um, in order for that, prima, that, that burden of proof um, to be shifted. Because that burden of proof is not immediately shifted. It ha they have to demonstrate that prima facie showing. Um, you know, hardworking Nevadans shouldn't be scared to speak to their supervisors or, uh, about unsafe working conditions. It's essential that we pass legislation that is going to keep employees safe in Nevada. That's good for employers and it's good for employees. I really do appreciate uh, the chair, chair for giving us time to have this discussion about this legislation. I look forward to continuing this dialogue and I urge your support for AB 222. Thank you, Assembly Member Torres. I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 222. Okay, members, the last bill we have on our agenda for bill hearing today is Assembly Bill 124. We've have our very own Commerce and Labor Committee member, Assemblywoman Duran, here to present the bill. So I will open the hearing on Assembly Bill 124 and invite Ms. Duran to get started when she is ready. Good afternoon, Chair and Chair Haudegui and committee members. It's been uh, quite a long afternoon. Um, but anyway, my name is B. Duran, representing uh, Assembly District 11. I am here today, today to present AB. Assembly Bill 124, which reduces pay dis disparities and expands protections for employees who are subject to dis discriminatory pay practices, as well as maintaining equality and fairness in employment practices. So I'm gonna give you a little background information. We are living in an unprecedented time doing, du unprecedented time due to the global pandemic. Gender and economic inequities that already exist in our country have been magnified due to the health and economic crisis facing us. Data, oops. Data released by the United States Census Bureau shows that between 2018 and 2019, no progress is made on closing the overall wage gap, gender gap, with the average full-time working woman still earning just 82 cents for every dollar earned by men. This gap in earnings translates into $10,157, less per year in median earnings, leaving women and their families with less money. What would closing the wage gap mean to women and their families? The National Women's Law Center broke down what the difference of $10,157 equates to. So that would be two months of groceries, $1,354, three months of childcare payments, $2,778, three months of rent, $3,213, three months of health insurance premiums, $1,431, four months of student loan payments, $1,088, and six tanks of gas, $274. Employees are protected from discrimination and compensation under several federal laws, including the Equal Pay Act of 1963, which addresses sex discrimination in employment and promotes the principle of equal pay for equal work. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits employers from unlawful employment practices, including discriminating against an individual through compensation based on, on a protected class and Title I of the Americans with Disability Act of 1990, which prohibits discrimination against a qualified individual on the basis of a disability. Our state has addressed this issue to ensure pay equity by establishing a similar provision in NRS 613.330. Employers cannot discriminate a person's compensation based on race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression, age, disability, or national origin. Oops, excuse me. Then why does a pay gap still exist? The Pew Research Center notes that a large racial and gender wage gaps in the United States remain, even as they have narrowed in some cases over the years. Among full and part-time workers in the United States, 
Blacks in 2015 earned just 75% as much as whites in median hourly earnings, and women earned 83% as much as men. Looking at gender, race, and ethnicity combined, all groups with the exception of Asian men lag behind white men in terms of medium hourly earnings. According to a recent Pew Research, Research Center analysts in the US Bureau of Statistic Data, white men are often used in comparison such as this because they are large, are the largest demographic group in the workforce, 33% in 2015. Gains have been made in educational attainment and labor force involvement over this time for those in these protected class, classes. Yet, studies have noted that women are paid less for the same work. One reason for this may be due to an employer's re reliance on job applicants' sale, salary history to set the starting pay. This perpetuates the wage gap when an employer either consciously or subconsciously makes decisions that may be based on possible pay discrimination from a, foyer, from a former employer or within the labor market. Throughout the, country, throughout the country, state and local governments across the country are adopting laws and regulations that prohibit employers from requesting salary history information from job applicants. At least 19 states and 21 cities and other jurisdictions have passed such laws. So I'm gonna walk you through the sections of the bill. The logic behind this bill is straightforward. Assembly, oops, I'm sorry. Assembly Bill 124 will provide additional protections against pay discrimination for employees and prospective employees in Nevada by prohibiting employers from relying on salary history to set pay when hiring. I would like to discuss the relevant sections of this bill using the amendment that was submitted to the committee and is available on Ellis. Section one of the bill is deleted, which would have prohibited employers from discriminating against employees on the basis of sex by taking certain actions relating to the employment opportunities of, the, of an employee. After discussion with stakeholders, this concern is sufficiently addressed by NRS 613.330. Sections two through 10 of the bill amends chapter 613, employment practices of NRS. Sections four through six of the bill defines employer, wage rate and wage rate history. In section four, I propose to amend the definition of an employer by using the existing definition in NRS 613.310. An employer means any person who has 15 or more employees for each working day in each of the 20 or more calendar weeks in the current or preceding calendar year. It does not include the United States or any corporation wholly owned by the United States, any Indian tribe or any private membership of membership club exempt from taxation pursuant to 26 USC 501C. Section seven of the bill makes it, unlawful for, makes it unlawful employment practice to require the wage history of a prospective employee or to rely upon the wage history of an employee to determine the wage rate he or she will be paid. It also makes it unlawful to, to take certain actions based on the refusal of a prospective employee to disclose his or her wage rate history. You will note the amendment adds employment practice to section seven on page four, line 15, to conform with existing statutory language. Statutory language. To align the intent of the bill, I propose to amend section one, subsection one of section seven to replace seek with require, the wage rate of the history of a prospective employee. Section eight of the bill requires an employer upon the request of an applicant made after he or she has completed an interview to provide minimum wage rate for the position being applied for. The employer must also disclose the salary range, wage scale, or if such a range scale is not available, the minimum wage rate for, for a position to an employee who has completed an interview 
or has been offered a promotion or a transfer to the position. I am proposing an amendment to remove minimum from subsection one of section eight on page four, lines 37 and 45, and line 45, to clarify the full pay range should be provided, not just the minimum wage rate. Section nine of the bill establishes the civil remedies available to a person affected by a violation of these provisions. The amendment would modify subsection three of section nine to read, in any action brought pursuant to this section, the court shall allow a prevailing employee or prospective employee reasonable cost, including attorney's fees. The intention of this amendment is to eliminate a potential bearer barrier for an employee or prospective employee bringing an action. Section 10 of the bill authorizes the labor commissioner to impose an administrative penalty against the employer for violating these employment practices and to bring a civil action against the employer. The amendment proposes to replace the Nevada Equal Rights Commission with the labor commissioner. And this concludes my amendments. And this is to ensure that all protected classes are not left behind in the pandemic's recovery. We need to continue to improve salary transparency. And this measure will continue to help equalize the wages. Thank you for your consideration of AB 124 and I am available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Assembly Member Duran, for your presentation. And before we go to committee members, I just have one question that I'd like to ask. Um, uh, Section 7-1, sub 1, sub one it used to say it is unlawful. It would have, with the amendment, it would have said it is an unlawful employment practice for any employer to seek the wage rate history of a prospective employee. And we're cha changing that to require the wage rate history of a prospective employee. Can you walk me through the difference between um, the seek and require? Well, basically, if you're asking to seeking, so you're asking uh, an employer to, uh, an employee to get their wage rate to require is them is to, that it is required of them to let you know. You can seek the employment history of her wage rates for uh, like a background check, if, if, if you will, on that. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you so much, Assembly Member Duran. I will now open it up to questions from the committee, and we can start with Assembly Member Dickman. Thank you so much, Chair. Appreciate that. Um, both of my questions have to do with Section 9. Um, first one is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if does the if the EEOC requires an employee to file a complaint within 180 days. And the Supreme Court has said two years is the time frame for a wrongful term filing a wrongful termination. Why does this bill allow for three years to pursue such an action? We would just, uh, Assemblywoman B. Duran, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Dickman. Um, basically, we tried to kind of uh, did that, and if it's uh, law, we will amend this to uh, conform with the current statute. Okay, thank you. My other question is also, it's actually in your amendment on section nine, and it's kind of similar to the question I had in the last bill. Um, any action brought pursuant to this section, the court shall allow a prevailing employee um, cost of their attorney fees, but, but what happens if the employer prevails? What do we do to compensate them? Again, this is this is law for uh, as before. People are going to not file a frivolous lawsuit. And from my understanding, I believe there's only five cases that cases that have been filed with the labor commission concerning um, any of these employment practices. So, so there's nothing in place to that would reimburse the employer if. They were the prevailing party, and then spend I'm, an awful lot of money. Thank you for the question, Assembly Dickman. This is Assemblywoman B. Duran. Uh, thank you for that question. I believe there is already protection for the employers that have uh, heard the last testimony from Mr. Kim that says, I believe it's sub uh, 
NRS 18 that has uh, protections for the employer to for an employee to file a frivolous lawsuit. So this, this just concerns me that we're changing that idea, but thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Assembly Member Dickman. Um, members, any other questions? Okay, Assembly Woman Tolls. Thank you, Chair, and um, um, thank you for the discussion around this bill. Um, I remember we had some similar discussions in 2017 on uh, AB 276, which I supported with where we um, talked about voluntarily disclosing wages and not having retaliation tying back to previous conversations. But um, uh, I know this one takes it further. Um, I read that in section 10, we've got a $5,000 fine. And I'm wondering for each such violation, where we came up with that, where you came up with that number and um, how that compares to fines and similar statutes. And, and if you need to get back to me offline, um, uh, that's fine. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Assemblywoman B. Duran. Um, if you notice in the uh, conceptual amendment, we did revise that to have Nevada equal uh, rights before and took the labor commissioner out of that for the fines. So my, my apologies, follow up, Madam Chair. Yes, go. Assembly member tolls, please. So I guess I didn't read the conceptual amendment that way. So we're we're changing it to the Nevada Equal Rights Commission in Section 10. Um, so does, and does that also mean then we're removing any penalty? So we don't have the five thousand dollar penalty for each such violation, or not more than five thousand for each such violation. Assembly one. Assemblywoman B. Duran, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Tolls. Um, from my understanding, the Nevada Equal Rights Commission can allow an employee to sue if they prevail in that, if they feel that there is violation of that. And I believe they would um, go to an attorney at that point. And I'm not sure how that process works, so I may get back to you on that. Thank you. And I, and I know we don't have our legal... Council here said maybe we can follow up with that. That would be great. Actually, Assembly Member Tolls, I believe we have Ms. Jenkins with the Nevada Equal Rights Commission. If she, I'm not, I see her walking down to unmute herself so she can walk us maybe through that process. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Kara Jenkins, um, Administrator for the Nevada Equal Rights Commission for the record. And just wanted for clarity to, to could I get a restatement of the question? I believe the question was, um, again, through you, Madam Chair, to the committee member, um, what is the process when it gets to the Equal Rights Commission issuing a right to sue? I just, can someone just clarify the question so I can go through the process and talk about our fines? Sorry, uh, with your permission, Chair, I'll restate the question. Yes, Assembly Member Tolls, please. So currently in the text of the original bill, um, section 10 outlines that the um, the labor commissioner may bring civil action and that that la labor commissioner may impose um, against a person an administrative penalty of not more than 5,000 for each such violation. Uh, we have a conceptual amendment that um, states that we're cha changing the enforcement authority from the Labor Commissioner to the Equal Rights Commission. And my question is, um, does that text of the bill imposing the authority to um, pursue civil action and to impose fines, penalties of not more than 5,000 for each such violation also translate over to you, the Equal Rights Commission to um, right. as a part of this bill? Thank you, Assemblywoman Tolls. Um, may I address you directly? Yes, please, Ms. Jenkins, you can go directly to the member. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, it, that's a layered question. So uh, currently right now in our statute, we do um, for intentional misconduct on the part of an, of an employer based on discrimination in pay, the NERC's, NERC's commission can impose 
fines. That was established in Senate Bill 166 with Senator Spearman's Equal Pay Bill last session. It's now codified in NRS 233-170, subsection 3, with a listing of the fine, fines and penalties. Um, so we already do this. Um, it's something that um, is only required of certain types of employers. Uh, there are limits, though. Um, so to, in order to impose fines, we have to at least give um, the employer a 30-day notice. I believe it's got to be an employer with 50 or more employees. Uh, so there are there was a lot of back and forth last session as to how this would play out. And so we already do have this power. So how it would relate in this conceptual amendment to what we already do now is, is the question that we would have. Um, and we'd like to work with the, the bill sponsor on that. Um, but we already possess the power to um, administer fees and fines um, for certain types of employment discrimination in pay that is egregious. We have to still give the employer 30 days notice to correct and they still have to have at least 50 or more employees before we have a hearing and then impose fines. And you can find that in NRS 233-170, subsection 3, and I'm happy to provide that um, to the committee if needed. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. Yes, if you could send that over to us. And it sounds like we just need some clarification. And I remember this from a bill that I've carried in the past that the $5,000 um, penalty that the labor commissioner may impose, it's actually what's built into the statute for the labor commissioner. Those that um, find that already exists in that chapter for the labor commissioner where she can impose those fines. So that's where that $5,000 comes from. I think where we're going to need clarity on the conceptual amendment is that if we're moving on Section 10 under the jurisdiction of NERC instead of the Labor Commissioner, that the fee structures um, for NERC would apply and not the fee structures for from the Labor Commissioner's department. Thank you. And then I did notice, um, Madam Chair, if I could just, just kind of elaborate. When we talk about equal pay, um, there are a couple of statutes in play here. So we have state law. We have Nevada state law, NRS 233. We have NRS 613. We also have Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which says you cannot discriminate against an employee um, on the basis of sex. Um, then we have the Equal Pay Act. Um, and so sometimes when folks, okay, so let me talk about filing. So if you file with the Nevada Equal Rights Commission, we take the case and we run the investigation. Sometimes we will look at, um, we'll look at it as a, as a we'll, We'll make sure that we've crossed off every check mark or dotted all our I's and crossed our T's to make sure that we also are not missing on a Title VII complaint. For an Equal Pay Act complaint, someone can just file with the EEOC on an Equal Pay Act complaint. They have two years from the date of harm, which is usually the last uh, unfair paycheck, the last discriminatory paycheck. They have two years. If it's intentional discrimination based on pay, you can go up to three years if you file directly with the EEOC. If you file with NERC, um, you have 300 days for the data harm, okay? If it's a Title VII complaint and you file directly with EEOC, EEOC will probably now analyze it under an EPA or a Title VII complaint, whatever the investigators think they want it, they think the case falls under. And that kind of also alters the, the, the statute of limitations, but um, states are free to extend the statute of limitations to up to three years. So I hope that I hope that makes sense. Again, if you need any uh, guidance on that, um, I'll take a look. Um, and I'm certainly happy to help the committee and the bill sponsor in any friendly amendments that, that I can make or insight that I can give. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. And I think, uh, Ms. Assemblymember Duran, I think what um, we would just need is, um, I know you're working on a conceptual amendment. Just, um, I think we're looking for clarity on, on section 10 and where those fines, uh, more clarity on the fines, whether there still be the fines in um, section 10 from the original amendment, or if your your intent is to move the fine structure under the fine structure of the Nevada Equal Rights Commission. Thank you for that question, uh, Chair Howdy. Yes, I think the intent was to, um, to have Nevada Equal Rights do an investigation as well as to see if there is a uh, legitimate complaint and then to proceed that way instead of going through um, the Labor Commission at that point. That's the intent. And I can work with uh, uh, Mrs. Jenkins to clarify the language if possible. Thank you, Assembly Member Duran. Members, any other questions? Assembly Member Hardy? Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, I wanted to go to uh, section four. Um, and as I read that, this definition of employer would capture all employers instead of um, currently Nevada and federal law, it applies to those with 15 or more employees. So um, if you could let me know if I'm reading that correctly and um, why the change there. Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman B. Duran, uh, to uh, Assemblywoman uh, Hardy. Um, that was concern of several of the stakeholders about the employees, about the different, uh, uh, there was uh, several inquiries about what that means because of the fact that they have different, um, when they're interviewing uh, a prospective employer, or employee, they do some of them base their um, um, wage rate according to their uh, wage wages that they had in their previous positions as well, for example, a teacher. So to hire a teacher, they would basically look at their history of where they taught, who they taught and how much they made to base their um, job, new job that they're applying for on that. So we um, amended that to conform with a uh, six point, 613.310 in the NRS. If that answers your question. Thank you. Committee members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we are going to move into testimony in support of Assembly Bill 124. On um, broadcasting, could we please check the telephone line for those who are wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 124? Yes, Chair, to testify in support of AB 124, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 130, please fully state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. -E -E and I'm the Policy Director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada in support of Assembly Bill 124. Women in Nevada and across the U.S. are still being paid lower wages than men simply because they're women. In fact, next week on March 24th is Women's Equal Pay Day. As the Assemblywoman noted, on average, women are paid 82 cents for every dollar a man earns. It takes women until March 24th to make the equivalent salary of what a man earned in 2020. And these numbers are even worse off for women of color. We are being shortchanged thousands of dollars each year or more, accounting to hundreds of thousands of dollars over a lifetime because of the pay gap. The practice of asking previous salary histories only perpetuates pay inequity and makes it harder and harder for individuals to shatter the glass ceiling. Our economy relies on women's work and these wages can make the difference between a family that's just scraping by or one that's getting ahead. I ask that you vote in favor. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller, please. If you recently joined the call and would like to testify in support of AB 124, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you recently joined the call and would like to testify in support of AB 124, press star nine now to join the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 540, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and I begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Serena Evans, spelled S-E-R-E-N-A-E-V-A-N-S, -E -E and I'm the policy specialist for the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence, and we're here in today in support of AB 124. I wanna first thank Assemblywoman Duran for bringing this important bill forward. According to the CDC, one of the most effective ways of preventing domestic and sexual violence is pro by providing economic stability for women and children. 
However, according to the status of women in the state, a national report which examines each state policies for women, Nevada ranks 45th in the country for providing fair and equal employment opportunities for women. Ensuring that individuals are given the same equal opportunity within an organization as others is vital in ensuring career growth and subsequently economic stability. It is also important that employers not have access to a prospective employee's pay history. A person's previous salary should not determine their worth or salary with future employers. This bill establishes the needed equity in ensuring that everyone is paid the same regardless. This small but meaningful change will have positive effects for all working individuals and will provide the opportunity for economic stability for survivors who may currently be dependent on an abusive partner and may prevent an individual from becoming financially dependent of an abusive partner, preventing future victimization. We urge the passage of AB 124. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Evans. Broadcasting next caller, please. If you recently joined the call and would like to testify in support of AB 124, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 035, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chairwoman and honorable members of the committee. My name is Quentin Savoy. That's Q-U-E-N-T-I-N. Last name Savoie, S like Sam, A like Apple, V like Victor, W-O-I-R. I'm the Deputy Director at Make It Work Nevada. We work alongside Black women and Black families to fight for economic, racial, and reproductive justice. I'm proud to speak with you today in support of Assembly Bill 124, a measure to bring greater pay equity standards and economic justice to our labor force. During the last legislative session, we were fierce advocates in support of Senator Spearman's pay equity legislation, and we're grateful to Assemblywoman Duran for sponsoring this important next step. The practices and provisions that this bill will regulate against are routinely used to perpetuate pay inequities in our state. These inequities have devastating consequences for women, especially black women, as they stand to lose nearly $1 million in lost wages over the span of their career. As unequal payday is rapidly approaching on March 24th, we're proud to support a policy that moves us closer to pay equity, because when we pay women fairly, we strengthen our communities, our workforce, and we strengthen the futures of our children. We urge bipartisan support for Assembly Bill 124, and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 805. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. You can press star six to unmute. Caller with the last three digits, 805. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jessica Stender, J-E-S-S-I-C-A-S-T-E-N-D-E-R. I'm Senior Counsel for Workplace Justice and Public Policy at Equal Rights Advocates, a women's uh, rights nonprofit uh, committed to ending the um, pay discrimination that we have heard a lot about today that plagues women and particularly women of color. And for that reason, we're calling in strong support of Assembly Bill 124. Um, I thought I would just really quickly touch on a few of the questions in case it's helpful, just regarding the 180 days versus um, three years question. We've seen that either 180 days or 300, depending on which EEOC um, deadline is applicable in, in the state that it applies to, is just woefully inadequate for many workers to be able to assert their rights. It's so short that by the time workers are aware that their rights were violated, they often have missed their deadline to file a claim, their statute of limitations to file a claim. So for that reason, we, we are very strongly um, supportive of the three-year um, uh, statute of limitations in this bill. And then addressing the question that came up with regard to prevailing party fees, um, that the prevailing plaintiff um, employee is entitled to fees, to allow an employer to recover fees would, would really impose a, a completely chilling effect on workers such that they would not bring such claims uh, at the, in the risk of, of having to potentially pay fees in the end. So that's a, a point that we advocate for in, in all of the um, prior salary and other equal pay related bills that we 
um, that we advocate on behalf of. Um, so I will leave it to other colleagues to discuss the importance of the bill in other ways, but wanted to touch on those two points. Thank you very much for your time, and we urge your I vote on AB 124. Thank you so much for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 352, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Abraham Camejo. For the record, A-B-R-A-H-A-M, last name C-A-M-E-J-O. I speak not only as a small business owner, but as a father of five daughters and, a, and as a son of an immigrant mother that is also a small business owner. Equal pay is something that needs to be supported for not only for the future of Nevada, but for the future of my own daughters. I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Camejo, for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 837. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Hello, this is Kent Irvin, K-E-N-T-E-R-V-I-N for the Nevada, Nevada Faculty Alliance. We support SB 124. Our salary schedules at NC are already public and published, so that's not really an issue. But when our for for our own employment situations, but when our graduates go out into the workforce, we want them uh, not to be discriminated against, nor for these perhaps unintended consequences of looking at past wages uh, to cause uh, discrimination in future salaries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Irvin, for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 237, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, committee. My name is Marlene Lockard, representing the Nevada Women's Lobby. AB 124 is another bill that builds upon the previous pay equity legislation to actually reach the ever elusive goal of pay equity. The um, compensation levels for a job position should be determined by the job requirement, skill set, education levels required. It should have nothing to do with what an applicant previously made in her compensation uh, history for previous jobs. The Nevada Women's Lobby um, strongly supports this measure to again try to bypass the loopholes that seem to always rise in an effort to uh, defer real true pay equity. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ms. Lockhart, for your testimony. Broadcasting, do we have anyone else signed up to testify in support of Assembly Bill 124? Chair, sure. there are no more callers for support at this time. Okay, thank you. Next, we will hear testimony in opposition. Broadcast, can we check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 124? Yes, sure. To testify in opposition of AB 124, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. If you recently joined the call and would like to testify in opposition of AB 124, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of one, two, four. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. We'll have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of one, two, four, you are unmuted.
Caller with the last three digits of 150, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Hey, thank you. My name is Andrea Johnson, uh, A-N-D-R-E-A-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. -S I'm actually to testify in support, but I unfortunately pressed the wrong number earlier. May I proceed? Yes. Thank you. My apologies. Um, I'm with the National Women's Law Center, and I'm here in support of Assembly Bill 124. Um, we're very excited to see Nevada finally joining the movement to ban the harmful practice of relying on salary history and require salary range transparency. These are really proactive measures that will help insulate Nevada businesses against wage gaps arising in their workforce to begin with, and thus decrease businesses' exposure to equal pay lawsuits. Uh, 14 states have now passed these bills, all with bipartisan support, and research is already showing that they are helping close the wage gap in those states, which is incredibly exciting. Um, we want to encourage that this bill applies to all sizes of, of employers, not just those with 15 or more employees, um, as the amendment proposes. Um, every state that has passed the salary history ban has applied it to all sizes of employers. And that's because this is an easy to comply with provision, regardless of employer size. Just don't ask for salary history. And we, you know, we want to make sure that Nevada is not setting a bad precedent by becoming the first state to limit this important protection in this way. So it's really important the bill apply to all sides of employers. And also to the question about um, seeking salary history versus requiring salary history. Those words do sound similar, but we would strongly encourage that the bill say seeking salary history. We're concerned that prohibiting requiring salary history would allow an employer to, for example, ask an applicant for their salary history on a form or in person and say, you know, what's your salary history? You're not obligated to provide it for me, but what's, what is your salary history? We know from research that power dynamics negotiations and the hiring process make it hard for workers, women and women of, women of color especially, to refuse providing information once asked for it, and actually it can backfire and result in lower wages for women. So we think those Keeping that word seeking in the bill is important and the employer size threshold, or rather no employer size threshold, this covers all employers as is done with equal pay laws. Thank you. Thank you. And we will make sure to move your testimony into the support position. And I just wanna go back broadcasting. I've gotten a couple of messages and I know um, this caller also had some trouble unmuting herself um, to give testimony and uh, support and raise her hand. Um, could we go back to Caller with the last three numbers of one, two, four. I think they just texted me to see if they, they could try again to unmute themselves. Yes, sure. Thank you. Caller with the last three digits of one, two, four. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Paul Moradkin. M-O-R-A-D-K-H-A-N with the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to thank the sponsor for meeting with the Chamber about AB 124. Um, in regards to the bill, the Chamber has no issue with the intent at, and, the, and supports the efforts in addressing pay equity. The Chamber supports the principle that there should be pay equity between employees um, for all work regardless of gender. We do not have an issue with Section 1 in the bill that bans employers' ability to ask history wage from applicants if that helps further support existing state and federal laws regarding J pay, uh, sorry, gender pay equity um, disparity. However, we have concerns with several provisions of the bill as how it impacts the state's legal climate for employers, specifically sections nine and 10. We believe the time period should be two years and not three years, notably the subject of clarification on a bill that is currently being heard by the other house. The enabling of a class action lawsuit against employers and recovery burden placed on employers are a concern from our members. In a time of economic recovery, the Chamber believes the expansion of tort law beyond our current remedies would add challenges to our economic recovery. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Moradkin, for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 496. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Alexandria Dazlich, D-A-Z-L-I-C-H, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Nevada Restaurant Association, and we are here today in opposition of AB 124. 
The Nevada Restaurant Association supports equal pay in the workforce that is supported by the Ninth Circuit Court ruling. However, this bill exceeds that objective and opens our operators up to additional liability. This comes at a time when restaurants are trying to recover from the pandemic and would create an undue burden to our operators who are already trying to keep their doors open and their lights on. For that reason, we encourage you not to pass AB 124. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Doslick. Broadcast next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 116. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Hi, good afternoon. This is Craig Madol, C-R-A-I-G-M-A-D-O-L-E, with the Nevada Chapter of Associated General Contractors. I think that the Las Vegas Chamber and the Restaurant Association did a pretty good job of explaining um, the opposition to this bill. We have similar concerns. Uh, we'd like to thank, you know, Ms. Duran for her time to meet with us. We did provide a conceptual amendment. Um, but some of our uh, concepts have been adopted into her conceptual amendment, but we believe that uh, Section 9 and uh, some of Section 10 and Section 7 all still need some additional work, and we're happy to continue to work with the bill sponsor to address our concerns. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Madol, for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 700. Zero, zero. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Brian Wachter, B-R-Y-A-N-W-A-C-H-T-E-R, -E uh, with the Retail Association of Nevada. Uh, we want to thank you this afternoon for hearing our concerns. You know, uh, we're very proud that Nevada's employers have made a concentrated effort to um, try to tackle the issue of gender discrimination. Uh, we know that from prior testimony from NRIC last session that the number of instances of gender discrimination have continued to decrease over the last decade. Um, creating a private right of action or a class action response to this scenario seems to be an overcorrection to a problem that is not widespread but is taken very seriously by Nevada's employers. Existing law already provides a remedy to gender discrimination and imposes heavy fines, and we heard from the director of NRIC that they already have this power. Uh, we strongly object to sections 9 and 10. Uh, we do agree with uh, the Chamber of Commerce and uh, those in support of the bill that gender discrimination is bad, um, and we also don't have an issue with section 1 um, if you wanted to go ahead and provide that under the current remedies, remedies at NRIC, um, but we really do feel that Providing this private right of action or the class action situation will increase the burden on employers, especially our smallest employers, um, and we would ask that those sections uh, be removed um, so that we can support the bill. Um, and that is our reasons for uh, opposing AB 124, and we urge you to vote no. Thank you, Mr. Wachter, for your testimony. Um, broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 114. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Thank you. Greetings, Chair and members of the committee. This is Amber Stidham. That's A M B E R Stidham, S T I D H A M, testifying on behalf of the Henderson Chamber. Thank you so much for hearing us. I also want to be clear that our chamber strongly opposes any pay discrimination and really does support equal opportunity employment opportunities. Um, our members know well that compensation equity not only builds a more productive, diverse workforce, but it also makes employers more attractive to prospective employees. But the way that AB 124 is written, we are currently opposed. Um, not to belabor the point, certainly um, my, my friends in business here did highlight the federal protections already in place the extremely punitive penalties outlined the expanded statute of limitations that are concerning to us. We are also concerned, though, about um, in looking over the posted amendment just ahead of this hearing uh, that would adjust the attorney's fees that go from judicial discretion to mandatory that would be suggested for Section 9, Subsection 3. And then I would just like to highlight briefly that there are factors such as experience, education, location, and shift work that often do result in pay differentials between employees that are employed for the same similar positions that do not fall within the provisions of this bill, but do 
impact the overall compensation to an employee, and that additionally, while wages are an important aspect of any employment relationship, there are also other forms of compensation that are often negotiated between an employer and an employee during these conversations like overtime pay, bonuses, stock vacation time that provide value that add to an employee's overall compensation package, again, that are not considerations within this bill, and i just like to say that for the record. I really do appreciate your time, and um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Stidham, for your testimony. Um, broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 598. Please still state and spell your name for the record. We'll have two minutes and we begin. Thank you, Chair Hadegi um, and Committee Nicole Rourke, and I C O L E R O U R K E, representing the City of Henderson. The City does not oppose the policy addressed in AB 124. In fact, we already require the transparency outlined in the bill, and our represented employee wages salaries are negotiated through labor contracts, along with merit step increases regardless of gender. However, we believe that public employers do not belong in Chapter 608. Simply adding public employers or amending in the definition from NRS 613310 would make all of NRS 608 applicable to public employers. The result would be that NRS 608 and NRS 281 would both apply to public employers on the same subject of wages, which may lead to litigation as parties disagree on which statute has priority. I would also like to note that the Labor Commissioner gave an advisory opinion in May 2013 that NRS 608 does not apply to public employers. Thank you to Assemblywoman Duran for meeting with me prior to hearing to listen to her concern, and I appreciate the committee's time in considering a change to AB 124 to make applicable changes for public employers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rourke. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 781. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Nick Vanderpool, N-I-C-K-V-A-N-D-E-R-P-O-E-L with Capital Partners today representing the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce. Today, the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce is here today to oppose Assembly Bill 124. I know it's been a long day for you and your committee, so I'll say ditto to what many of my colleagues have already put on the record, but want to reiterate that the Reno Sparks Chamber is opposed to discrimination and supports equal opportunities. We will work with Assemblywoman Duran on AB 124 and look forward to the continued conversation. I appreciate your time and the hard work today. Hope each and every one of you have a happy St. Patty's Day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool. Broadcasting, do we have any other callers wishing to testify in opposition? Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. Um, it, can we check to see if there's anyone wishing to testify who is neutral on this bill? As Chair, to testify in neutral on AB 124, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And I do see that we have Ms. Um, Kara Jenkins from the Nevada Equal Rights Commission who will be testifying in the neutral position. Thank you, Madam Chair, for that. Kara Jenkins, uh, Administrator for the Nevada Equal Rights Commission, also known as NERC, for the record. And uh, we are encouraged by this bill. Uh, we do have some questions. Uh, we do want to work on um, hopefully getting um, um, to the committee um, our statute of our statute that kind of outlines the fines that we already have established um, and also working with the sponsor to ensure that um, she's uh, she has everything she needs to understand how we already operate so that you all can do what you do best and that's create legislation. Thank you so much. Oh, um, one more thing, Madam Chair, I don't know if you received an email from Labor Commissioner Shannon. Okay. Did. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. It, um, because it was a letter and support, I'll make reference to it after we close the uh, testimony neutral. Thank you. Broadcasting, do we have anyone on the telephone line? Yes, Chair. Caller with the last three digits of 411. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Lindsay Anderson. L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N on behalf of the Washoe County School District. 
We've met with Assemblywoman Duran and submitted an amendment that would address concerns by school districts. We want to make sure uh, that the unique needs of public school districts, collective bargaining agreements are acknowledged in the legislation. Our amendment is posted in Nellis and it would allow for the continuation of current practice that enables public school districts to meet the requirements of NRS 391.167, which requires that educators are given the same credit for previous teaching experience in determining salary placement when moving from one Nevada school district to another. Given the substantial differences in salary structure between districts, verification of prior salary placement is often required in order to convert it to a placement on the new employer's district salary schedule that credits the educator with the appropriate amount of service. Public educators are compensated on a schedule based on years of experience and educational attainment with no opportunity for variations in placement based on gender. So an exemption of employees covered by 391.167 should not undermine the intent of AB 124. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for your testimony. Broadcasting, do we have anyone else um, in the neutral position on the telephone line? Chair, there are no more callers in neutral at this time. Okay, thank you. And committee members, I would like to note that um, for the record that the labor commissioner did send me a message that she had to leave for another meeting, but she provided a letter of support supporting the proposed amendment to me. I have I, that will be available for everyone tomorrow on Nellis. So thank you. Assembly Member Duran, would you like to give any closing remarks? Thank you, Chair Hadegui and committee. Uh, Assemblywoman B. Duran, for the record, uh, I want to thank you for your consideration of AB 124. I ask your support of AB 124. Um, and I am happy to work with any and all stakeholders of, A1, uh, of AB 124 to move going forward. Thank you, Assembly Member. I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 124. Our last item on the agenda is public comment. And while we give those listening over time, those who are listening on the internet time to call in, I will go through some public comment housekeeping. I would like to remind those present and listening over the internet that the period for public comment is an opportunity to discuss general matters that fall within the purview of this committee. The public has already been given time to support or oppose specific legislation. We open and close hearings on bills so that we establish a record of the public testimony on the bill. Therefore, public comment is not intended to be a continuation of any bill hearings. Public, public comment may be limited to two minutes. Please address your remarks to issues that fall within the jurisdiction of the Commerce and Labor Committee. If you direct your remarks to issues over which this committee has no jurisdiction, I will ask you to redirect your comments or terminate them. Be respectful of committee members and other witnesses. Do not comment on testimony provided by other speakers and please do not make any personal attacks. You may also submit written remarks for inclusion in the meeting record. Broadcasting, is there anyone on the public telephone line who wishes to give public comment? To take your place in public comment, please press star nine now to join the queue. Chair, the public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. Um, thank you, committee members, um, for your patience. I know this was a longer than normal hearing. Um, we will have some longer hearings going forward as we have um, received many bills. I, our next meeting will be on Friday. Please note, once the agenda is posted, the start time, we may start earlier um, than our normal 1.30 start time. So with that, um, committee members, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.